welcome to those um, that are now participating uh, as well from uh, Europe. So let me briefly uh, present myself. My name is Matthias Buck. I'm the Europe Director at Agoba Energiewende. Um, with uh, my team, we are working in particular on EU climate and energy issues and are very deeply um, involved in the current um, further development of the EU emissions trading system, as well as the work on establishing European carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, um, work on climate policy is a challenge that unites everyone on the planet. Um, we are in an increasingly difficult climate crisis and in turbulent times. And this makes cooperation internationally even more important. And particularly cooperation between Europe and China is essential if we are to tackle successfully uh, the carbon crisis. Now, Europe in some respects has um, worked for somewhat longer time on carbon pricing policies. China only recently decided to establish a carbon uh, in emissions trading system in China domestically. In Europe, uh, we started uh, such a system already 20 years ago. So there is quite some experience and perhaps lessons to be learned uh, from the European experience. Of course, the specific uh, circumstances are different in China and in Europe, but um, by and large, I'm quite uh, convinced that some of the lessons uh, with emissions trading in Europe may also be of relevance uh, when further developing this uh, system in China. Now, we have a very rich program ahead for this afternoon. I will not say much more now, but hand over to my colleague, Kevin Tu, who is Managing Director of Agora Energy Transition China for a recap of the morning discussion that, so that we can all as a group start at the same level of information into the afternoon. Kevin, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Matthias. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Please excuse me for speaking in Chinese. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Greetings again. I would like to avail this opportunity to quickly brief you about uh, the morning session that we had and in the morning time of Beijing. I would uh, like to kindly ask my colleague to help me with the screen share. We quickly uh, scrambled a presentation which can capture the gist of the discussions this morning. Let's start with uh, the background and agenda, the opening remarks, the keynote speeches, as well as uh, the panel discussion that uh, we uh, enjoyed this morning. One theme was highlighted uh, in the morning discussion, which uh, is uh, the multiple crises that we face represented by the conflict between Russia and Ukraine and the reshuffling of the power play between China and the United States, as well as the energy crisis, which only points to the necessity of the cooperation between China and Europe on a series of issues, including energy transition and climate change. Here, we've uh, put together statistics to show why China, Europe, and Germany are crucial to the global energy outlook. When we uh, look at uh, world economy on and subsectors such as economy and energy these four um, players are very on 
pivotal if we use a color coded system or traffic light system. We see a Russia and Western countries, uh, such as the United States and the United uh, and and the EU, already seeing red in terms of uh, their bilateral relations. Regrettably, on uh, I feel we have to stay uh, cautious when it comes to. China EU relations and for China and the United States somewhere between red and yellow. Um, and with that, that background of uh, backdrop, without concerted efforts between China and Europe, the world climate agenda at the crossroads and the world order will not see any optimism, which will only threaten the sustainable development of the mankind. That is why we have the responsibility and obligation to work hand in hand for the morning agenda. Well, um, these are some photos that we took from uh, the hybrid event. We were very. 就是非常权威的四位专家做了市场阻止演演讲，后面呢就是我们的圆桌讨论环节。那么我们上午的主持人呢是上海国际问题研究院的呃于宏源所长。呃，于所长呢，呃，就是在那个呃中欧，就是关系以及全球治理领域啊，有很深的造诣。上午呢，他很好的主持了今天的研讨。我们上午开幕的第一个那个主旨，呃，就是呃那个发言嘉宾啊，就是是杨建先生，他是上海国际问题研究院的副院长，他提到啊。和中国一样，现在越来越多的国家加入到了绿色经济、低碳转型的这么一个呃，就是一个进程里面。More countries、um, now, I need to understand that、uh, long-lasting peace, lasting peace is crucial. Help、uh, people and understand well, the、um, outside、know. world, and also in my own presentation, I have especially emphasized uh, uh, well, why is me, it that when it comes to key climate to and energy issues, China and Europe need to engage in continuous dialogue, and the carbon market is just one of those the topics. And carbon market is just one of the many issues and and that we have in common interests and concerns. Well, and、uh, who is the chairman of our co-organizer energy investment committee of AIC? He mentioned that China and Europe are important partners in global climate governance, and both sides have announced net zero emission targets. At the same time, China and the EU are the most important trading partners to each other. That's why we need to engage in in-depth collaboration. Partners of each other. That's why、uh, cooperation is、uh, and、uh, necessary. And、uh, this morning, we also、uh, heard a speech by Ms.、Uh, Meng、uh, from、uh, Guangzhou Carbon Emissions Training Center, who said uh, uh, there is、uh, four sets of relations that we need to balance. That is between development and emissions reduction, whole and local, long term and short term, government and market. We not only need to learn from、uh, lessons、um, that、uh, experiences, but also lessons that we need to、uh, envision、uh, in the entire world. We need、uh, stock taking about、uh, the、uh, operations uh, of uh, the carbon trade scheme, as well as other dimensions of、uh, carbon emissions reduction. And then we on heard a speech、um, by Mr. Xiao from SPIC Carbon Asset Management, who mentioned and that.、Um, As a central enterprise in China,、uh, it already pledged a carbon peaking by 2023. If all central enterprises in the energy sector can follow the example of SPIC and their pursuit of carbon neutrality and peaking even earlier, then we will see a very optimistic.、Uh, 
outlook. Carbon reduction is, needless to say, the cornerstone of carbon neutrality, which was once again reminded for us by Mr. Sal. Mr. Sal also pointed out that CBM is a starting point instead of the destination for Chinese businesses. Their future relies on concerted cooperation and collaboration. We then were very honored to hear the speech from the founder and general manager of Beijing Center of Carbon Technology, Mr. Tang Renhu, who on uh, this speech was entitled Practice and Implications for the Transition of Chinese Power Enterprises. We mentioned that there are five things we need to clarify first. Economic and uh, energy, ecology, security, and their livelihood. And power enterprises need to understand their uh, current positions while pace themselves in achieving the two carbon goals and uh, different focuses that should be placed for short, mid, and long-term strategies. He also prescribed very good recommendations accordingly. Then we had uh, a foreign speaker, Ms. Song Xuedan from EDF China, who shared with us uh, uh, the management, as a management data, EDF and applications for uh, China. He said 90% of electricity of EDF has already achieved a carbon neutrality she also walked us through the four stages of the EU ETS, which uh, are very precious lessons for China. For a panel discussion, it was my uh, good uh, colleague, Dr. Inming from uh, uh, China. Uh, Agora Energy Transition China, who is the moderator, and then we had uh, Mr. Yan Lu Hui uh, as uh, who led the uh, discussions uh, and his Roman Carvis job. We also had uh, uh, the honor of uh, listening to the remarks made by the panelists on stage, including Ms. Li Jin from uh, Shanghai Environment and Energy Exchange, Mr. Jolly. Um, from uh, Carbon Trust and Mr. Yang, and uh, also um, uh, from uh, uh, Hubei Carbon Emissions Trade Center, Dr. Xu Hao from Tencent, Mr. Alex Sun from Envision Group, and Mr. Tang Wei Min from WWF. Well, in energy uh, transition, it uh, was Agreed that uh, lots of precious lessons have already been learned. Well, in the era of the two carbon goals, the biggest challenge is lacking of specific standards and criteria. Everyone in the industry need to be on the dynamic trajectory and continue to enrich themselves with information. And the market requires continuous endeavors from all stakeholders so that we can have a pathway that is leading us towards carbon neutrality. And uh, we uh, also need to understand uh, the um, need the very much needed system for innovation, uh, which has been exemplified by the Shenzhen uh, power exchange. Everyone agrees that uh, supervision of the government is important, but despite that, markets should be given opportunities and space in order for the carbon market and asset management to truly advance to a higher level. Thank you very much. That is all from me for the summary. Thank you, Kevin. That was uh, very, very interesting for those of us that could not participate in your morning uh, exchange. Um, and without further ado, I want to move to the second part of uh, the afternoon's agenda. We have a number of keynote speeches that will squarely focus on the EU emissions trading 
um, experience so far, as well as on uh, offering some perspectives on the carbon border adjustment mechanism that is currently under development in the European Union. And uh, so I would first invite um, Professor Zhang Zhongxiang, who is the founding dean of the Ma Jinchu School of Economics at Tianjin University to um, inform us on his perspective on the Chinese carbon market and its coordination with the power market. Um, Mr. Zhang, the, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, the organizer, for inviting me. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come here again. And after coming back from the um, think tank, I have participated in multiple rounds of dialogues on the topics of, for example, China-U.S. dialogue and China-U.S. collaboration. And this morning, I also attended the webinar. It was very well done, and I have also learned a lot from the morning session. And today is my great honor to talk about the China's uh, carbon market. What are some of the lessons we can learn from its experience? And then I'm also going to briefly talk about how it coordinates with the power market. And then I would like to look to the future to see what the Chinese carbon market needs for future development. As we know from the 11th five-year plan, China already set the target for energy uh, conservation. And ever since the 11th five-year plan until today, we see that um, three five-year plans have passed during this period. And um, China has failed to complete the objectives in two such five-year plans, even though the government didn't explicitly talk about it. I mean, even sometimes when they reached a target, it is often uh, through administrative measures, the efficiency was actually quite low. However, now China is faced with even more stringent energy saving objectives, especially for the two carbon um, objectives. Um, that's why it's very important to engage market mechanisms to reach the goal. And that's why now the Chinese government begins to attach more importance to carbon trading scheme. So that's why you may see that in seven provinces or cities, starting from 2013, a pilot was started for carbon trading scheme. And now close to 3,000 enterprises have engaged in it. So this is something new. Um, from the design to the operation of the pilot project, it's fair to say that the um, project has reached the preliminary results. And also there are some valuable lessons gained from it. But still, it is a very small scale. The trading every day is about 10,000 to 20,000 tons. So this cannot really compare with the scale we see in the European Union ETS. And also the carbon pricing was quite low. On average, it was about three to four US dollars per ton. Now, now that China has set the two carbon targets, in the next uh, few years, the Chinese government needs to invest um, at least um, 300 trillion or even more, but the government can only spare so much. The majority of the investment needs to come from the society, and that's why we need a uh, pricing guidance, and that's why we need to make sure that um, China's carbon market becomes a national market that is truly governed by market mechanisms, and that's why starting from last year, this enters into a new stage. Now, why the power sector was chosen as the starting point. Well, this is because if you look at the carbon emission of 4.5 billion tons of carbon dioxide emission came from this particular sector. And also this particular industry has um, simple product and the data there were are fairly accurate. So that's why 
Now, 2,160 power companies have been um, pulled into the um, carbon uh, trading scheme. And the trading has officially started uh, last year on July the 16th. And this is how the market went um, since last year. Basically, on the first day, the results were actually quite good. We see the transaction um, that is worth uh, 210 million RMB for 4.104 million tons. But ever since then, the value, the volume of um, transaction began to drop. And it is only when it comes to close to mid-November when we again see massive amounts of transaction coming back again. So that's why in December, the average daily transaction was for 6.16 million tons. And the red curve here represents the pricing and the volume is represented by the numbers on the left. So as you can see, the red line, the pricing has maintained um, at around uh, 40 to 60 RMB per ton, but it's not a very high pricing. I'm gonna explain my rationale in a moment. Now, I'm going to look back on the uh, first year of operation for the national carbon market. We have been told by the ministry that the CR was very good, 99.5%, but what was not told, and also what is we're, what's something we're more interested in, is if you look at the um, number of enterprises and also their compliance rate, and this is the number I have come up with. So if you look at the enterprise level, we have 121 power companies that have not complied Applied. So if you look at the power sector, particularly the CR was only 94.4%. So that was 5% lower than what was given by the ministry. And also there are vast differences in between provinces. The lowest CR rate was registered in Ningxia, only about 82.9%. And we have um, 14 provinces or cities um, whose CR is lower than the national average. And that got us thinking, why are there such big differences in the CR? And why are there so many enterprises fail to comply? There are two reasons here that I would like to especially mention. So first of all, when the government does um, quota allocation, they allocate um, extra quotas, especially to large enterprises. Uh, in some cases, uh, large power companies have 16% more permits than they need, and the large enterprises are reluctant to sell the permits, and that's why there is such a big gap in the number of CR. In addition, in order to get um, more attractive numbers or better numbers, and the they also look at, they set a very high cap uh, in terms of the content of carbon in um, the fill. So that means for a power um, company, if the um, upper limit is higher by 20 to 30%, and that means every year they need to pay extra. And the power companies as well as the companies that are responsible for auditing are then motivated to come up with fake numbers. And this is related to how the policy was designed and drawn up. Of course, in March or June, the Ministry of Environment and uh, Ecology have lowered this upper limit by about um, 8%, but still we need to see how this is tested in reality. In addition, if you look at all of the transactions, they're mostly um, those bulk agreement contract transactions. Um, about 80% of the transactions fall into this category. Um, and there is a 10% discount for such uh, bulk agreements. So that's why that has discounted the pricing. And this morning during the discussion, we talked about the management of carbon assets. Um, of course, they can do some asset management for those large groups, but this is not good news for the government because this is a lot of the times the behind the scene transactions, it does not truly show the benefits of um, CO2 emission reduction. It does not really show the marginal costs. So this has distorted the real pricing. We would like to see the transactions mostly governed by market mechanisms rather than relying on the bulk agreement transactions. And another thing that people may have observed um, as shown in this graph, again, the red line represents pricing um, and the transaction volume is again show on the left hand side. And we see that a lot of the enterprises that engage in transaction do that mainly for compliance reasons. Um, and 
from the end of last year until now, we see very low transaction volume again, and that shows enterprises are mostly driven by compliance. In addition, we have a lack of liquidity, um, and we see that if you if you look at the Chinese market versus the European market, the turnover rate in the Chinese market was very low. It was only about 2%. Um, and there are many reasons for this. I think one of the reasons is that the power companies are not yet familiar with the whole mechanism. If they're familiar with the mechanism, they can buy low and sell high so they can make some money here. Uh, the reason I say they're not familiar with this mechanism is that even though we had seven pilots run, but out of those 2,000 um, power companies, only a small minority participated in the pilot. So 90% of the enterprises had zero experience. Um, of course, this is expected because if you look at our un study of the carbon pilots, Beijing and Shanghai are the most advanced cities, but it's only in the last month of the pilot when we saw um, a peak in the transaction volume that accounts for about 73 to 80% of the total transactions. Now, as the pilot goes on, will things begin to change? It's really hard to say because we see that um, during the pilot, the enterprises that participated in the pilot were fixed. But as China roses out, we have more players, we have more enterprises joining that are quite new to this. Um, will we see improvement? I think this, again, um, depends on how things will go. And in addition, like I said, the reason why there is a, a low amount of transaction is because for some large power companies, they have an oversupply of those permits or allowances, and they're reluctant to sell. So for example, we see um, in, in some cases, for example, for uh, China Huadian Corporation, they have the largest um, amount of allowances and they have about 16.2 percent of the allowances that are abundant for, um, abundant for them however the problem is that smaller power companies do not have any allowances to buy so can we help those small power companies with compliance this is a very key problem to fix in addition if we look at the carbon market of china all of the Chinese media were talking about the fact that China is the world's largest copper market, but that's far from being true. Because when we look at the um, size of the carbon market, we need to look at the size of the transaction. Actually, by this amount, the European Union has the world's largest carbon market. Because if you look at um, the volume, uh, the, the value of transaction last year in China, it was about 1.29 billion euros. While in the European Union, um, it is um, 683 billion euros. So China is far behind. But if you look at the CO2 emission covered by the Chinese market, China indeed has the largest market in this sense. And also, as the European Union cuts the CO2 emission, the amount of CO2 emission covered has reduced even more in the European Union. So if you look at the amount of CO2 emission covered in the Chinese market, in this sense, we're the largest market, and this will continue to grow. And in addition, China is enforcing uniform or consistent rules, and carbon market is a very important part of it. So that means the carbon market mechanism will be improved in the future and the market will grow to include more players. But there are several factors to consider. Which industries should we cover first with a carbon market? This has a lot to do with the emission characteristics as well as the data of those inter in industries. For the power industry, it's very simple because the product they produce is electricity. But for other industries, they have many different production lines and then that has very high requirements of the data. In addition, with the um, carbon tariff of the EU, um, there are already some industries that have uh, been affected and that have incorporated um, a lot of the practices. So I think maybe these industries should be considered um, as a priority. And I think particularly steel, uh, cement um, should be considered um, because steel and cement account for about um, 12 to 15 percent of the total emission. If you add those top industries together, they account for 25 percent of the total emissions. If you add the power sector, then all of 
those um, sectors in total account for 70% of the emissions. So now if you can include those industries in the ETS system, this can really help China reach the CO2 emission reduction goals with relatively speaking low costs. And this is very important. In addition, I would like to talk about the coordination in between power and carbon markets. Just now I've talked about the fact that carbon pricing cannot be too high. This is because in China, the, car, uh, the electricity pricing was set by the government. So we cannot really translate the carbon costs to the lower stream industries because if the cost is too high, then um, the companies cannot shoulder the cost. But if you do not set a reasonable carbon pricing, we do not have the motivation in the lo uh, lower stream, the downstream uh, industries to upgrade uh, and to renovate um, their facilities. So we really need to come up with a mechanism to coordinate in between power and carbon markets. Now that we have the EU carbon tariff, especially there's a greater need for green electricity. And there are a few factors to consider. First of all, uh, how we connect the green certificate industry with the uh, carbon market. We want to avoid users paying duplicated costs in two markets. And we want to make sure that right now we have this so-called green certificate. And what it does is that it basically um, replaces the energy subsidies. And for green certificate, you pay first and you transact later. Um, but for green electricity, it's the other way around. So for many enterprises, paying for the green certificate does not prove that you are using green electricity. So now you have that. And then if you want to use it to deduct the EU carbon tariff, this is not a good accepted and that's a major issue here and also for the power companies um, you have the green electricity but in china the green electricity is managed by a different department that manages um the um etcs so now you're basically paying twice um and this is not yet well very well connected and linked and now with the eu carbon tariff um in china there are two parts to the CCR. There are some um, that are from the carbon sink and there are some from the um, green electricity transaction. So this is um, posing some challenges. You can only choose one out of the two. Or you do CCTR on, or you use it for CBAM. You can't have both ways. And also for green electricity, there is a big issue which is that now the country supports the green electricity, of course, but when it comes to the demand centers and coastal areas, and there is no such thing as levelized green electricity and for subsidized green electricity, they don't want to participate in the trade. So supply is small, demand is big, and then we need to trade across provinces, which will then involve the demand curve of green electricity and also losses on, you know, uh, when it's uh, set into the tariff and who's going to bear the cost of these losses. These are all concerns that we have and John uh, uh, has nothing to do uh, even with uh, the coordination with the carbon market. And next, I want to talk about how to further uh, develop uh, the uh, carbon market and starting from 2013, I've been uh, talking about, um, you know, carbon emissions legislation, which is crucial uh, when a certain cost of the comes product, especially when cross-province trade is involved uh, to avoid disputes. We end uh, uh, the emissions are actually reduced. We need legislation. And in 2013, we've been writing articles, uh, pushing for at least articles and opinions from the state council, or at least regulations for certain sectors. Otherwise, so. Uh, it is a loosely managed and uh, supervised environment, and we need uh, uh, sectors uh, to work with each other, and we have um, uh, we need more uh, flexibility uh, between different investments made for those, uh, such as those made by individuals and by companies. And for the second mission period, how the quotas should be allocated. Well, now you see there is a definitely a progress for the first implementation uh, pro uh, the period from 2019 to 2020. Um, the allocation mechanism was the same, but now it's different, which is good. And also uh, for the um, 
public consultation paper in March, um, we see that uh, the base uh, value, uh, the objectively speaking, is more relaxed than before because it considers more of uh, the uh, coal, uh, you know, supply situation. Those are good news, uh, but there are also an active size. So, for instance, uh, uh, very soon, uh, 2000. Uh, well, we only received the a quota for the second phase after uh, the previous one and uh, the combat for companies that they now are rushed at uh, making plans and i think compared to the first phase quota i think it must uh, reduce by at least 6.5 percent maybe seven or eight so that's how much the cap should uh, be lowered and we need to uh, in the future publish these on uh, you know allowances uh, and caps uh, earlier so companies can actually uh, prepare for them and for the year for the uh, european union and uh, phase three is to 2013 and then it's from 2021 to present and every time when the targets were on issued it was very clear as to you know how much percentage was less uh, compared to the previous phase and it's good for in the stakeholders and they have anticipation on uh, and it's more predictable and so china can learn from europe and next thing that we need to caution is uh, as i said um i think that uh, smes uh, are challenged because large enterprises have higher quotas and for SMEs can they really fulfill their obligations can they really implement uh, these uh, uh, targets uh, largely determines uh, China's uh, success and also their uh, full implementation or failure will uh, be the make or break for China in the long run. And we need a market mechanism, for instance, uh, auctioning for SMEs to succeed. And speaking of auctioning, and now China is often talking about a common prosperity uh, from carbon. I want to say uh, two benefits about uh, auctioning first a higher carbon prices, which helps with uh, picking and carbon reduction and also help with um, you know, they are rational of electricity and next uh, financing, which can then be used uh, to set up a foundations for energy transition. And for those uh, that are mostly impacted and less developed, uh, and they can receive financial support. This uh, actually um, uh, helping to to, to, to bridging the gaps between different regions and for the European Union, they are doing similar things because there are regions that are less uh, advantaged. And China can also learn from European other uh, fronts. We're talking about uh, how to better allocate allowances. Well, for uh, the first to zero of five to zero seven auction was 5% and for second it was 10% of auction. And then uh, 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 so 13 to 20, it was much lighter and now it's going to be 57% to be auctioned. So I think China should also increase the auction quote uh, um, gradually <clears throat> um, towards higher levels. And uh, I think uh, there are also problems uh, uh, when it comes to data and statistics. Without good data, you can't really uh, do much. Um, and that also involves authorities if we actually temper with the data or alter it data. And sometimes we see that a government works with these, uh, also uh, with uh, the data agencies on uh, and fraudulent data, and that it must be prohibited in order uh, to have a healthy uh, carbon market. And that is all from me today uh, and uh, well actually my speech is based on a lot of articles if you're welcome uh, you are more than welcome to refer on uh, to those on, on, on articles so some of them are written by me I'll, I'll be very happy to share my slides with you after my presentation thank you very much um <clears throat> thank you so much um for this input uh, professor Zhang. so you highlighted um, I think, first of all, the importance of having a very a stable framework, a stable pathway uh, that gives clarity to all um, companies, in particular in the power sector at the moment, on uh, the path, the long-term pathway to um, towards a climate-neutral system. You highlighted, um, let's say, the startup challenges for the Chinese carbon trading system. Um, when it comes to setting the quota, when it comes to the specific allocation, and simply the, the, the need for the participants in the market to learn how to work with the new system, um, how to 
um, when to do transactions of allowances, etc. You also highlighted, I believe, very importantly, the the uh, need to look not only at the carbon market, but to see how the, the carbon market is embedded in the broader system of um, energy and climate policies. And this goes in particular, as you, as you were uh, emphasizing, to the link to the, the power price development and how the carbon price signal and the market power market price signal are um, uh, linked. And uh, you also mentioned that there's is a particular challenge now looking at the European carbon border adjustment mechanism and how um, to account for uh, potential exports to Europe, specifically um, looking at the carbon price signal. Um, you also mentioned um, that uh, going forward, there are um, ideas about auctioning <coughs> of allowances and also some challenges, I believe, on how to um, support innovation and the transition of um, companies participating in the carbon market system. I think there are a lot of uh, themes that I've witnessed in the European debate, particularly in the startup phase of the European emissions trading system. And um, so thank you for this very interesting and rich presentation, which I think is a, a lot uh, of food for thought and, and issues to discuss later on. Um, I would hand over now to my colleague Oliver Sator, who will give us a brief uh, stock take of where we are in Europe with the emissions trading system and also highlight um, how the emissions trading or the debate on emissions trading is taking place in context of what I would call a fossil energy crisis that is um, a consequence of the Russia-Ukraine war. Oliver, over to you. Thank you, Matthias, and I, I hope you can hear me okay. I'm uh, actually at the COP27 conference uh, in, uh, in Egypt, so I hope the sound is okay and the connection as well. Uh, indeed, I will talk today about the, the, the European Green Deal, the European Emissions Trading Scheme, sorry, um, and, and European Energy Security. Uh, just to go to the next slide. Uh, I'm having trouble to go to the next slide. And I'll, I'll try to share my screen again. One second. Okay. okay, this should work. Okay, so just to give you some background first on the European Green Deal. Uh, so in, in 2019, the European Commission... Um, proposed uh, a significant increase in the ambition of the, um, the European climate goals, uh, known as the European Green Deal. Uh, there were many elements to the European Green Deal, but one of the most immediate impacts is that the EU uh, will uh, try to achieve a minus 55% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, uh, uh, compared to 1990 levels. The current target is minus, 14, minus 40%. So this is a significant increase in ambition uh, in a short space of time. There was also a law adopted uh, already, which uh, is requiring by law uh, the EU to achieve a, a carbon neutrality by uh, 2050. Uh, and the EU is also adopting at the moment uh, legally binding sub-targets for the ETS sectors of the economy, for the non-ETS sectors of the economy, and for another sector, uh, which consists of land use, uh, particularly forestry and agriculture. Um, the increase uh, in the uh, targets, as you see, will require additional efforts for European um, member states to, to uh, achieve. Uh, as you can see from this chart, uh, the EU uh, uh, outperformed uh, the 2020 targets it had for emissions, but this was only a minus 20% reduction. Uh, so, as you can see from the projections now to 2030, with the existing policies and the planned policies that, are, that uh, countries in Europe have, this would not be sufficient to achieve the 2030 minus 55% target. And so this is why the European Union is putting forward a new package of measures to ensure that the EU can actually achieve these more ambitious targets. Uh, I can't go through all of the 
uh, different policies. There are far too many. There are over 20 pieces of legislation now covering different topics. Um, but to give you some sense of the, the, the how significant some of these policies are, I wanted to share just five examples. Uh, so one is there will be a full ban on the sale of, of all internal combustion passenger vehicles from 2035 in the EU. So essentially, all vehicles will need to be electric or emit no CO2 in use to be sold in the EU by 2035. Uh, this is a major revolution for the auto industry in Europe. Uh, in addition, uh, the EU is trying to significantly reduce emissions and energy consumption in buildings. So there is a, there were new laws regarding buildings and energy efficiency, which will require that uh, as a first step, all of the 15% least energy efficient buildings in all EU, EU member states must be renovated uh, and their energy performance must be improved by around 45% uh, within about 10 or 11 years time from now. Uh, if we talk about the emissions trading sectors, so the power sector, the industry sector and other uh, stationary combustion installations like district heating networks, uh, the cap on emissions will be reduced substantially. Um, the EU will actually reduce the, cap, the total emissions in these sectors by 2030 by 63% by, uh, compared to 2005 levels. The idea is that it's a bit easier to reduce emissions in these sectors than in some of the other sectors like agriculture, and therefore these sectors must do more by 2030. Uh, the EU will also uh, increase the share of renewable energy in final energy consumption by between 40 to 45% by 2030. Um, the current target, uh, oh, sorry, the current amount of renewable energy in final energy consumption in Europe is 22%. So this would be a doubling of renewable energy in, in uh, electricity, uh, heating and transport uh, by 2030, so in the next eight years. Uh, in addition, the EU has many other policies. There's a, there will be minimum quotas for the use of hydrogen and e-fuels in industry, aviation and maritime transport. Uh, there will also be new energy efficiency targets. Uh, there will be new rules on uh, to require zero emissions buildings to be developed for existing buildings. Um, there will uh, be uh, more uh, improved recycling and circular economy policies. I can't go through all of the list here, uh, but there are many, many things that are part of this package because this is what's required to achieve a climate neutral economy by 2050. Uh, I will put all the other details here on this slide and maybe uh, the colleagues can share the slides with the participants later if you would like more information. Um, the one important point to note is that the, the European policymakers do not think that economic growth will be harmed by uh, these measures. Uh, in, in fact, um, the, the evidence so far has shown that European policies to reduce energy consumption and emissions have not hurt economic growth. So you see on this, on this graph that economic growth has increased about 50% in the last 25 years, while emissions have declined by about 26-27%. So if I talk now about the reforms to the EU emissions trading scheme, um, as I mentioned, the, the, um, the emissions trading scheme, uh, which covers about 45% of emissions in the EU, uh, the cap on allowances, the total number of allowances will be reduced to about 63%, to, to make emissions reduced by 63% uh, by 2030 compared to 2005 levels. Uh, you can see that at the moment, the emissions, uh, uh, from this graph, at the moment, the decline by 2030 would be uh, closer to 40 uh, to 43%. So this would be a 20% increase in ambition. This will be achieved by a one-off uh, um, rebasing of the emissions uh, cap. So basically, 10% of allowances will disappear in 2024. And then after that point, uh, the the annual um, the rate of decline of allowances in the market will reduce by 4.2% per year. Um, I should also mention that the, uh, the, the ETS will be expanded to include emissions from shipping. So maritime emissions will be included also from 2024. Uh, or they will start from 2024 and gradually increase uh, uh, to be fully included by 2026. Um, free allocation will also be reduced to industry and to the aviation sector for domestic flights. Um, there's 
also uh, a, a proposal by the EU to um, in, to create a second emissions trading scheme because currently the ETS only includes, as I said, industry, power, and, and large heat combustion installations. So this is only about 45% of fossil fuel uh, use in Europe. Uh, the second ETS, we call it the ETS2, uh, the idea is to include also uh, fossil fuel use in uh, buildings for heating and in road transport. Um, part of the idea is to uh, collect revenue uh, from these sectors to create a, a 200 billion euro social climate fund to be able to fund uh, measures to reduce emissions in these sectors. Uh, I should say, however, this is very controversial in Europe. Uh, there is a, um, a concern about the social impacts of um, uh, increasing prices for household consumers. Uh, and so the European Council has proposed initially to limit the second ETS to just commercial uh, fossil fuels in buildings and, and vehicles. However, this will be technically challenging to implement. Uh, so there are still some questions open about this policy. Uh, also, with the increase in energy prices in Europe uh, linked to the war in Ukraine, there is um, some argument that, that actually energy prices are already creating the necessary incentives, and therefore the ETS2 is not as urgent. But this is still to be decided. Um, uh, the impact for the ETS-1, the existing ETS, uh, what we see as a consequence already of these reforms that are not yet finalised but which have been proposed is that the market has responded very strongly. The carbon price uh, historically has ranged between, uh, well, zero to 30 euros, but on average it's been about five to 15 euros per tonne of CO2. Um, but in the last two years, we've seen prices rise to average between 60 to 90 euros per tonne of CO2. Uh, and, and these prices have fallen a little bit uh, lately uh, due to uh, the, the um, high energy costs and, and the decline, the economic slowdown. Um, uh, however, uh, these prices are creating strong incentives for some actors in the carbon market to find alternative solutions, especially for industry. In the power sector, it's a little bit more complicated because uh, gas prices have also risen very significantly lately, and this has meant it's, it's not so easy to switch from coal to gas to reduce emissions. Um, uh, I won't talk too much about the carbon border adjustment mechanism, but one of the consequences of these high carbon prices in Europe uh, is that uh, there needs to be a way for Europe to protect its industry from simply moving offshore, because uh, other countries do not have similarly high carbon prices. Uh, at the moment, we give free allowances uh, uh, to industry uh, to protect them from this risk. But this solution is not sustainable after 2030 because there will not be enough allowances in the carbon market. So the EU needs to find an alternative solution. And this is why it is proposed this carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, the idea is basically that the EU would take away free allowances and auction allowances to industry. So costs for European industry would rise, but it would also then require imported uh, goods that are also covered by the carbon market to also pay for their embodied emissions. Um, the idea is that only emissions that are embodied in the product will be paid for. So clean products would pay a lower charge at the border, just like cleaner products in Europe would pay a lower charge in the ETS. So that this is compatible with the World Trade Organization rules. Um, I think one important discussion emerging in Europe at the moment is that it's um, it's not uh, enough to just do carbon pricing, uh, especially for the industrial sector, but even for you know the energy sector. Uh, additional complementary policies are needed. So carbon pricing is only one part of the story. For example, for industry, there is a lot of uh, uncertainty around the future evolution of the carbon price. And so for very expensive investments, one needs to provide some guarantees uh, and to hedge the risk of the carbon price. And so we're looking at instruments to hedge this risk for steel companies, cement companies, investing in the climate neutral technologies. Um, we also need to develop infrastructure to support these climate neutral technologies. So hydrogen uh, uh, electrolyzers and renewable energy production and hydrogen pipelines need to be developed in key locations 
And the same is true for electricity or clean electricity and for carbon capture and storage infrastructure. So the EU is also spending money to support this infrastructure. In addition, we also need to create markets because uh, for these low carbon industrial goods, because um, in the long run, we cannot subsidize all of the technologies. It's far too expensive. Um, and the uh, industry is more willing to invest at scale if there are clear uh, markets being developed uh, where customers will pay a higher price for their goods because they are green. Uh, and so this needs to be developed through public procurement policies, through labeling of cleaner products, and through regulation of embodied carbon in, in products like buildings or vehicles or packaging. Uh, finally, I want to talk a little bit about the impact of the, the war in Ukraine and, and energy security the crisis that the EU is facing on the European Green Deal and the ETS. Uh, so, uh, as you may know, uh, uh, energy prices, for especially for gas and electricity, have risen uh, by between uh, three and four hundred percent in Europe uh, since 2021. Uh, this is partly because of the uh, COVID uh, uh, disruptions to supply chains due to COVID, but it's also strongly linked to the fact that Russia is using energy as a weapon in its in its war in Ukraine. Uh, Russia has cut 80 percent of gas supplies to Europe uh, in the past uh, nine months. Um, there has been sabotage of, of energy infrastructure, particularly gas pipelines to Germany. Uh, and Europe is, some European countries are also providing spare electricity to Ukraine because up to 30% of the electricity production in Ukraine has been uh, uh, destroyed. Uh, this is having consequences, this, this is making it more difficult for the EU to, uh, and the EU ETS to incentivize a switch from coal to gas, sorry, sorry from, from, yeah, from coal to gas, um, or from gas to clean electricity, because uh, gas is now more expensive than coal, uh, uh, and for power generators, uh, and, and electricity is more expensive uh, than, or, or as expensive as gas for industry. So you see on this graph that uh, coal consumption for power generation, uh, if you compare the last five years uh, in the month of July, it was declining very significantly. It declined by over 50%. Um, however, in the last two years, you see an uptick in coal consumption. It, it has not completely regained the initial level, but there's been some increase. Uh, and correspondingly, you see gas, which was increasing to replace coal at the margin in the power market, has declined a little bit uh, recently. Uh, the situation is also made worse because in Europe we have some problems around hydropower production. There have been uh, low levels of rainfall uh, last summer, and this has reduced hydro production compared to historical levels. And there has also been uh, maintenance of, uh, of a large share of our nuclear uh, power production fleets, especially in France, uh, which is also lowering our electricity supply. However, these things, unlike the gas shortages, we think these things will be temporary. Uh, and will not uh, create a long-term problem. Uh, the question is, how will this affect the European Green Deal? Um, I think in the short term, it means, as I said, that incentives from the ETS or from uh, uh, you know prices to switch to gas or to switch to electricity are, are more limited, and therefore governments will need to um, uh, subsidise these changes more strongly uh, and, and we can't just rely on markets to provide these signals in the, in the next two to three years. However, um, the, the weaponization of energy has, uh, in this war has strongly made European countries very committed to work together to phase out their dependence on fossil fuels from uh, third countries. And, and this means that um, there will be an acceleration uh, in the next five to ten years a very significant acceleration uh, of deployment of renewable energy, perhaps even going beyond what's proposed in the European Green Deal. Um, so you see already from this chart that solar and wind have already been increasing significantly in the last five years. Um, that will probably now accelerate even further because of the crisis. Uh, there is also an effort to reduce uh, demand for gas and electricity in Europe. There are new regulations for the next uh, year requiring uh, minimum cuts in 
gas and electricity consumption to ensure that Europe doesn't have uh, power shortages or, or gas shortages. And we are di diversifying some of our remaining gas supply via liquid uh, natural gas, uh, by biogas and hydrogen production as well. So in summary, I think it is a temporary problem for the EU transition, there's no doubt about it. But I think in the long run, this will actually accelerate the transition in, in Europe. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Oliver. I think this was very um, succinct. Um, just as a complimentary thought, um, so Oliver was very much uh, underlining the ambition that is in the Green Deal. I think it is important to underline that um, the project of the Green Deal is not only seen as a project to reduce um, carbon emissions, to bring us in Europe on a pathway to climate neutrality, but really as a very broad investment and modernization program of the European economy. And Oliver was highlighting some of the structural changes that will happen as a consequence of the Green Deal in the mobility sector, in the building sector, in the industry sector. And <clears throat> so some of the, the, the points made by Professor Zhang in his keynote, I think I echoed here, it is very important to understand the current debate on the further reform of the emissions trading system in Europe in context of the broader transition that is happening with the Green Deal and all these related pieces of legislation on renewables, on building efficiency, on industrial transition. Coming in, a second complementary point I would like to make is on the revenues from the emissions trading system. I think it cannot be overestimated uh, how important the revenues from the emissions trading system are to support the transition, particularly in industry, to help companies innovate, as well as to shield some of the vulnerable groups in industry and in society from higher prices of carbon. And this is specifically an issue that Oliver was mentioning when it comes to the idea of or to proposal to expand carbon pricing to housing and to transport, where it's very clear that this is politically only possible if there are significant uh, significant revenues from this carbon pricing instrument used to specifically support um, building renovation and uh, modernization and, and ramping up of the infrastructure for electric uh, mobility in particular. Um, so I think this is uh, kind of just some complementary thoughts. I also want to echo what Oliver said um, so when the, the Russia-Ukraine war started, many in um, the climate and energy space were concerned what this could mean for the Green Deal as a political project going forward. And what we have seen um, again and again is that um, the politicians in Europe are doubling down on the Green Deal as the project that will not only reduce um, energy and climate emissions, um, greenhouse gas emissions in Europe, it will that will modernize Europe's economy, but that will also, and this is now particularly important, uh, rapidly reduce uh, the dependency of Europe on imported fossil fuels. And uh, so as a direct consequence of um, the Russia-Ukraine war, Europe has decided to actually accelerate the Green Deal as a political project, particularly in ramping up renewables faster, going faster on efficiency in buildings, doing more to uh, scale up a hydrogen economy, et cetera. So if at all, as Oli said, the Russia-Ukraine war and the energy crisis resulting from it is uh, accelerating Europe's transition to climate neutrality. So I'm <clears throat> uh, leaving it here with, uh, thank you, Oliver, for uh, this impulse. Um, as you mentioned, the, the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism is, from a European perspective, seen as a necessary complement to uh, drastically increased emissions in, uh, sorry, a drastically increased reduction pathway in the European emissions trading system. And uh, so it is important to understand how the European CBAM would not only work within Europe, 
but also interact with our international trading partners. Because as I said, very initially, um, and also my colleague Kevin was underlining, um, we will only resolve the climate crisis in a cooperative spirit. So it is very important to understand how cooperation um, also around the CBAM can um, happen in concrete terms. So let's move to the next topic of this keynote uh, part of the agenda. And I would invite uh, Mr. Wu Bixian, who is a senior partner at Highways Law in Beijing, to uh, offer his perspective on the EU CBAM. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. My uh, topic today is EU CBAM from a Chinese perspective. Actually, it's my individual perspective instead of a Chinese, the Chinese one. Mm, just as some of the personal take that I would like to take this opportunity to share with you all. CBAM is closely related to the carbon market and the EU, which is the starting point for us to understand anything. The very root CBAM was proposed is to resolve um, the carbon leak problem on from the asymmetrical, uh, asymmetrical policies uh, on carbon reduction from different member states uh, and, and I mean of the world. And what uh, is the carbon leakage? Well, when the carbon price is very high, your Europe, uh, the European businesses have a very uh, high cost of production, and then they may be actually motivated to move away from Europe into countries that, that where carbon is less expensive. And also, it may lead to um, uh, products that, that do not suffer from high carbon costs to enter Europe, thus uh, uh, making European products less conductive. Uh, and some call that carbon dumping. So these two are representations of a carbon leakage. Well, and uh, when an industry uh, emits on the carbon outside a uh, EU, it causes carbon leakage, which then leads to uh, two uh, problems. First, uh, the EU believe if carbon uh, is leaked, then the total uh, carbon emissions actually will increase instead of a decrease. Uh, why so? Well, uh, the EU is very stringent on emissions, but if a business uh, is relocated to a place where it is very loosely regulated, uh, how to put it, well, this uh, business can just uh, free, uh, freely uh, emit as much as it wants, and then uh, the EU definitely will lose businesses and jobs. But I want to mention that a lot of scholar, scholars have written articles saying that carbon leakage will not happen, and it is rather controversial, but let's leave the controversy aside and agree that such risk does exist for the existing carbon market mechanism the eu on uh, definitely has put into uh, in place the a mechanism to prevent carbon leakage which is free uh, uh allowances uh, to european businesses so that they will stay within uh, Europe. And so that is uh, the current way to prevent carbon leakage and the EU ETS mechanism that we know, uh, which we know already uh, went through two phases. And in those two phases, the allowances were given free of charge. And the third phase started in 2023 which marked the first year where power sector did not have free allowance anymore. 
and uh, sector has said that uh, that, we're, uh, that had a risk of carbon leakage could still get free allowances and they would get uh, the allowances 100 percent based on industry benchmark but the 100 percent is not the 100 percent of the actual emissions but to the industry benchmark uh, to put it in plain terms it is on the uh, top 10 percent on carbon uh, reduction um I mean, companies that are top, top 10 percent, they are actually used it as the industry benchmark. And then so uh, 100 percent of how much the image is used on uh, as the criteria for the free allowances. And starting uh, so from 2021, 2025, which is uh, the first half of the phase two, and these five years is 30 percent of that benchmark. No more. Free allowances uh, have given rise to a series of challenges, and now there is a, a catalog of carbon leakage from the EU, which currently contains uh, the 63 um, sectors and subsectors, which account for 94% um, of the total industrial um, emissions and another series at 96%. So um, these high emitters uh, in Europe are considered uh, suffering from uh, risks of carbon leakage, so they can all get free allowances. And so please take a look at the graph, which is this a steel and air industry from uh, on uh, you know all the way to 2021 the red is free allowances the other green is the actual on uh, emissions they see the steel industry actually got enough free allowances to cover all the emissions they actually had and this oversupply of free allowances uh, on it, it meant less incentives for them to act on reducing emissions and the existence of the free allowances in the eyes of the eu is greatly undermining the price signals of carbon also uh, undermined the effectiveness of the eugs and compared to uh, that, you know, as I said, 2000, uh, from 2013, power sector uh, could not get free allowances anymore. And uh, that, uh, uh, and from that year on, carbon emissions and uh, power sector really reduced. And so you can see on the uh, graph on the bottom right hand corner, you see the electricity sector emissions in uh, blue and uh, red. On, and the red is industry and blue is the electricity, which does not have free allowance anymore. And also there is a difference in terms of how easy it is uh, for um, power sector or electricity sector alone to uh, decarbonize. And just to, to sum up, well, to prevent carbon leakage, uh, the EU is giving um, free on uh, allowances, um, but uh, the free allowances on are actually under cutting the effectiveness of the mechanism. And also, the EU has already raised the 2030 emission target from 40 to 55, which means carbon leakage risks are probably more imminent. That is why the EU needed a solution to um, the free allowances. They need to find an alternative to. Uh, to uh, keep the businesses within Europe while at the same time incentivizing businesses to decarbonize. And that's the background of CBAM. So uh, CBAM um, refers to embedded carbon imports uh, charged um, on, and uh, it uh, directly relates to the price gap between the EU and the exporting com country. It uh, um, uh, helps to prevent all the uh, problems from occurring, um, as we discussed before. So CBAM was created to prevent carbon leakage. Um, in to a certain degree, the European uh, Commission already uh, laid it down in plain terms. This is an alternative tool um, for the free allowances, and the EU wants to increase the effectiveness of the carbon market on with a CBAM. It will gradually replace the free allowances, so it will definitely incentivize high emitters, industry emitters to decarbonize 
to reduce carbon emissions. And from that, I think it has a reasonability uh, climate wise. However, CBAM has very apparent externalities on or what we call coercive externalities. So, on the one CBAM is uh, and in action, it will force other countries to do things. First, they have to uh, take the carbon pricing approach and establish a carbon market to price their carbon. And that's how they need to decarbonize. And apart from a carbon market, they also need to increase the carbon price so that the carbon price can approximate the price in Europe. As then these countries fail to on uh, achieve either of the two when their products enter the EU market, they will be punished by CBM. Um, and just now I've talked about the coercive effects and one of the um, implications for that would be the coercive effects on the instrument choice of foreign climate policies. We all know that the EU believes that carbon pricing is the most cost-effective climate policy, and this is exactly what the EU has done. They have trusted the economic um, principles, but as mentioned by experts this morning, carbon pricing is not the only cost-effective approach. So, for example, in China, China has adopted ETS together with other measures in combination. While in the United States, they do not have a national carbon market, it's really hard for it to establish a national carbon market anyway. That's why it has to resort to other means. For example, the recently enacted um, the um, IRA Act, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, actually, this is little to do with inflation. This is just a pure climate. Um, Act, um, act about industry policies. Now, um, because um, CBAM um, is charged based on the difference between EU carbon price and foreign carbon price. So for other countries, they must first of all have a domestic carbon pricing that is recognized by the EU. And for the United States, they need to first create a carbon market, which is basically mission impossible given the U.S. politics. Well, in China, we do have the national carbon market, but if we would like to get under the CBAM uh, system, the deducts or uh, discounts for carbon pricing, then we have to also include industries like steel, aluminum, or cement. Otherwise, the steel or aluminum we export to the EU, according to the EU definition, does not have a carbon pricing. So compliance with the CM, a CBAM is that when the EU judges, before the EU judges the, the level of climate policy ambition of other countries, the first judges a foreign country for its instrument choice, whether they have adopted carbon pricing. And the second point in the coercive effects is about um, its push for higher carbon price. So if you look at the design of CBAM, they evaluate the climate um, efforts of other countries based on the carbon pricing. If you look at the current design of CBAM, it basically forces other countries to raise carbon pricing to a level that is similar or compatible to that in the EU. Because the higher the foreign carbon prices, the smaller the price gap there is with the EU carbon pricing. So that's why when you export to the EU, there is um, lower um, CBAM burden. There is another way, of course, you can lower the carbon emission amount in the formula. But for products like steel or cement, no matter how much we try, we cannot reduce it to zero carbon emission. So that's why regardless, well, of course, we need to work on two sides. We need to work on carbon pricing. We also need to work on the um, embedded carbon. So there is a hidden assumption in the EU, which goes like this. If a foreign country's climate ambition is comparable to that of the EU, then uh, meaning that if they also cut carbon emission as strictly as the EU, then its carbon price level would be at a level that is similar to that of the EU. I think there is a bit of a problem with this logic in my perspective, because it is totally possible for a foreign country to be as serious about decarbonization as the EU, but for one reason or another, it is totally possible that its domestic carbon pricing is lower than that in the EU. For example, like the United States, they have no carbon pricing, but it does not mean they're not um, reducing carbon. They're not doing decarbonization. 
Actually, the root, the most important problem here is if we look at the high carbon price, do you, is it um, necessary to demonstrate your high climate ambition? If you look at the EU's answer to that, they believe carbon pricing is quite necessary to have high climate ambition. So CBAM basically judges a foreign country's climate policies only with the standard of carbon price, uh, carbon pricing. It is true that carbon pricing is related to the um, emission abatement measures of a country, but it is also related to the costs and efficiency of decarbonization at the um, economy-wide level. So for countries that have uh, lower costs of decarbonization, they have lower carbon price. The graph in the middle um, is from IETA, and it shows the shadow prices of CO2 in major economies. This basically is the costs of decarbonization. And we can see that there are vast differences among different countries. Developed economies tend to have higher decarbonization costs than others. Uh, among those, the EU has the highest decarbonization cost. Now, if we look back on the justification for CBAM, one question I would like to pose out there is that will the CBAM stimulate global decarbonization? My personal answer is that yes, inside the EU, because the CBAM will uh, cut the free allocation, and this will definitely encourage EU industries to cut emissions. But for countries outside of the EU, basically the rest of the world, yes. But the situation will be more complicated than that because according to the current design of CBAM, greener enterprises, those that do a better job in decarbonization are getting less rewards than those heavy emitters. Let's say we have a U.S. steel manufacturer that produces the world's greenest steel that there is in the world. So they are the world champion in green steel, so to speak. It is even greener than that in the EU, but when it exports to the EU, because the US does not have carbon price, they still need to pay for the carbon uh, border tax. It's just that they need to pay less, even though you're the greenest steel, you still have to pay um, because of this mechanism. Of course, if we look at specific industries or trade, this would be the logic, but I think if we think about the implications for climate, we also need to take a wider perspective. We also need to think about, for example, the psychological impact because the impact extends beyond a products or trade. Everybody's talking about the carbon border tax. Um, there is also the psychological implications because it sends a very clear message loud and clear to the rest of the world. And this is well heard. So in the future, global trade, as well as um, competitiveness of different countries will be affected by a new factor that is carbon here. And just one last thing I would like to say is that I just talked about how CBAM has some unreasonable points to it. Um, and I know that Aaron Cosby, um, who is going to come next, actually um, published an article in response to the paper that I published. And the, the, his point is that you point out an issue, but what are you trying to get? I don't know, but I think it is still worth pointing out the flaw in the design um, so that people actually see that. So I also have my own WeChat account. If you scan that, you can also see my collection of papers. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you, Mr. Wu, for this very clear perspective. And I think it is uh, highlighting for me, uh, coming from more a Brussels perspective on the debate, how important it is to discuss what the CBAM uh, is seeking to achieve and uh, what uh, the challenges are looking at it from um, the outside perspective. So um, particularly from a Chinese perspective, uh, my uh, understanding, but uh, Aaron, I will not um, uh, kind of jump ahead to some of your reflections. Um, my understanding actually is that um, uh, the CBAM is not is not a, uh, an instrument that aims to force to coerce other countries to adopt a specific set of climate measures. 
clearly not. And I think this has also been very clear in, in your presentation, uh, Mr. Wu, that um, the, the specific rationale for establishing the CBAM really is a consequence of the increased climate ambition in Europe and the, the simple fact that the system of free allocation that we have been operating in the past is, is just reaching uh, an end point and cannot be continued. Um, now, I do believe there are some efforts in the CBAM design, but Aaron will probably speak to it, to give actually recognition to uh, the policy regulatory environment, which is not carbon pricing policies in countries uh, exporting to Europe, uh, specifically um, <clears throat> when it comes to calculating the embedded carbon, because I believe this is the focus of the CBAM. What's the embedded carbon in products coming to Europe and then on that basis to um, establish some additional price signal that gives a level playing field to companies in Europe. Um, now, without further ado, uh, Aaron, I want to hand over to you and to perhaps complement what Mr. Hu said, um, which, I, uh, pardon, Mr. Hu said, I think is very important to uh, start this dialogue on what the CBAM really is about and where the design may anticipate some of the controversial um, um, yeah, controversial aspects that have just been mentioned. Aaron, over to you. Thanks very much. And, and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to be with you uh, tonight, my time, or early this morning, my time, whatever, <laughs> whatever you choose to call it. Yes, uh, let me just uh, try to share a screen here and get underway. I. I should note that, uh, like Mr. Wu, uh, I, I'm not actually speaking for the European Union. This is my personal perspective, but I will try to offer a perspective from the European Union's uh, uh, framing of the CBAM and uh, clarify first what the CBAM is, how it will work in practice, uh, and uh, run through the timeline of its implementation then think a little bit about what impacts it might have uh, and take a side trip to discuss whether or not the CBAM as conceived or border carbon adjustment more broadly is compatible with the principle of common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities, that's CBDRRC. Uh, and then finish with uh, placement of CBAM in the broader context of uh, the, the increasing accounting for carbon in traded goods. I benefit in this uh, presentation from the excellent presentations that have preceded me in this session. Many of the things I wanted to say have already been said, so I have the luxury of uh, skipping some of the basic uh, explanations and going more in depth than I had planned into some of the interesting side trips that are possible. So first, what is the CBAM? Uh, it's important to note that at this point, it is legislative proposal. Um, it has not been passed into law yet. It's a key part, as Oliver has pointed out, of the EU's Green Deal, and more specifically, part of the EU Green Deal's Fit for 55 package. That is, as Matthias said, the Green Deal is more broad than climate, but the Fit for 55, as an element of the Green Deal, is devoted to climate change. Um, and as uh, several people have pointed out, under that deal, we have a very ambitious target of 55% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 levels by 2030. This is maybe the most ambitious climate uh, uh, target globally, or certainly the most that I know. In part, as has already been noted, it aims to do this by reducing the free allocation that is given to covered firms under the ETS, um, exposing them to the full carbon price. And again, this has been explained well by previous speakers, and it has also been explained well by uh, Mr. Wu that this might lead to leakage. Leakage, I should uh, define here uh, to be for precision, is the increase in emissions in some foreign jurisdiction as a result of carbon pricing or climate policies in uh, a home jurisdiction. This can happen by a number of means. It can happen by a relocation of firms from the implementing jurisdiction to a foreign country. 
It can happen just by the loss of market share of existing firms. Uh, and let's take the EU as an example. It could happen by an, a loss of market share from EU firms to foreign firms who are exporting. It can happen by means of diversion of greenfield and in, greenfield investment from uh, uh, the Europe to other firms that are less burdened by a carbon cost. So there are a number of ways we could experience leakage, the, and the uh, the point of the carbon border adjustment mechanism is explicitly to prevent leakage. As Matthias said, it has not been uh, enunciated as a policy that is aimed at uh, encouraging other countries to adopt specific policies. Officially, it is conceived as a policy to reduce leakage and thereby enable carbon pricing in the European Union. Um, in other words, the European Union is imposing pain on its own producers uh, and would like to impose the same pain on foreign producers when they enter as imports uh, uh, on the goods from those producers when they enter the borders of the European Union. So to that end, importers are mandated and for, importers are forced to purchase allowances for each ton of carbon that is embedded in the imported goods. And the, the idea is to try to make that regime as uh, close as possible to be equivalent to the obligations that European producers are facing under the ETS. The covered sectors uh, um, are four goods sectors and electricity. Under goods, we have aluminum, iron and steel, fertilizers, nitrate fertilizers, and cement. We're not talking about uh, an instrument that goes all the way down to manufactured goods. We're quite high on the value chain here. So for steel, we're talking about basic steel, tubes, pipes, uh, uh, construction, construction grade steel, uh, nothing in the way of more processing than that. Only 29 goods covered under those sectors, as I said, very high on the value chain, basic and semi-processed goods. At this point, and I should back up to say that my description of the CBAM is based on the proposal of the European Commission. In a moment, I'm going to talk about the timeline and uh, make it clear that that's not what the final proposal or the final legislation might look like. But uh, I'm basing my description of the CBAM on the proposal that has come from the European Commission. And the European Commission has proposed that at the outset, at least until 2026, we're only talking about an instrument that would cover scope one emissions, direct emissions, in, and created during the process of manufacturing, not very importantly, scope two emissions, uh, emissions that are the result of purchased electricity, steam, or heat uh, purchased from off site. Um, and one of the reasons for this, the, one, of, one of the interesting side trips I am able to do, one of the reasons scope two is not covered. Um, if we think about the steel sector, for example, um, the, uh, the indirect emissions are significant in steel. They are more significant in aluminum as well. Um, but if the steel sector was covered and scope two emissions were covered, if we look at Chinese production of steel, on average, China is a more GHG intense producer of steel than are the average EU producers. However, there is a significant portion of Chinese steel that's produced quite cleanly using hydropower. So its indirect emissions are quite low and its overall emissions therefore are lower than the emissions of the average EU producer. There is enough of that steel, it, while it, it's only about 14% of total Chinese production, there is still enough of that to more than fill the entire export stream from China to the EU. So if scope two was covered, we would see a reorganizing of trade such that those clean producers would export to the EU um, facing very low or zero CBAM charges and actually be more competitive than the EU steel producers. Um, this is called resource shuffling. And it's something that the EU producers are very uh, agitated about and therefore they have lobbied not to include scope two until they can find some solution to what they see as a problem. I'm not sure everybody sees it as a problem, but they certainly do. The charge, and this is very important, uh, the charge under the CBAM is based on actual emissions. And I'll come now to talk about how that actually is calculated. 
<clears throat> there are three options. The, the first option is to demand actual emissions data from foreign producers, and this would have to be third party verified. And it's important to note here that this is the, the primary means of application of the CBA. Um, so, yes, um, if you do reduce it, it, it's important here to talk about whether this is a coercive instrument or not. Um, if you are a foreign producer and you reduce your emissions to zero by some means, you pay zero at the border for a CBAM levy because the, the emissions, the actual emissions are the basis of the CBAM levy. It will be a, uh, emissions times the EU ETS price prevailing at that time. So if you can reduce those emissions by some means, whether it's a carbon pricing mechanism, whether it's a regulatory regime like the US IRA, whether it's output-based pricing like we have in Canada, whether it's by some other means, by whatever means, by whatever policy tool, if you reduce your emissions to zero, you pay zero. Um, this, for me, undercuts the argument that the CBAM is a coercive instrument. Yes, there are incentives there to uh, put in place a carbon price, and I'll come to them in a moment. But at its base, it is about charging for emissions. So the first option is to be charged for actual emissions. If the actual data on emissions cannot be determined by the importers, the EU assigns a default value, which is the average emissions intensity of that sector in the country of export uh, for the goods in question. If that data is not available, and that's an extensive amount of data for all the EU trading partners, the EU assigns a very punitive second default, which is the average of the 10% worst worst performers in the EU. So you would like to avoid that particular option. <clears throat> there are two ways in which there's an adjustment to that CBAM charge. The first is um, to adjust um, for any free allowances granted in the European Union. So there will be a 10 10 year process of transition, I'll talk about the timeline in a moment, where the free allowances will be reduced and the CBAM will be uh, commensurately ramped up. During that time, when there's still being free, uh, when free allowances are still being granted, we will see a reduction in the charge of the CBAM to account for the fact that European producers have not paid a full carbon price either. The other way in which the CBAM uh, charge can be reduced, and, and uh, Mr. Wu was very clear on this, uh, is that any carbon price paid in the country of export will be reduced from the CBAM levy. We don't yet know what the methodology for calculating that carbon price looks like. Um, in the context of China, um, Mr. Professor Tong was uh, quite clear we have a, a low carbon price. But not only that, there are other elements that will complicate the uh, reduction of price for Chinese exporters. First, the Chinese carbon price is based not on uh, absolute emissions, but on emissions intensity. And so that's a different basis for calculation than what they have in the EU. It's not clear how the methodology would work to translate that price. Um, second, of course, the, uh, the national carbon pricing scheme in China is assessed on uh, electricity only and not on the, the goods that are covered under the CBAM. So the uh, credit under the CBAM would go to a carbon price assessed on steel industry, on cement industry, on aluminum, but not on power industry, at least not until scope two is covered. Uh, some of the uh, uh, pilot schemes do cover those energy intensive goods, but the national scheme does not. The timeline, so the commission had put forward its proposal for what a CBAM should look like in June of 2021. The European Parliament and the European Council, the Council representing the member states, have both given their opinions on what the CBAM should look like with some important differences. Uh, now we're in a process of trial law, and that is a negotiation among those three, and more importantly, among the Parliament and the Council, to, to set the final shape of the legislation. The timeline proposed would have that legislation agreed by the end of this year and in force by January of 2023. It's very likely that that imposition of the final legislation will be delayed by several months at least, but I, you know, I wouldn't see it delayed by years. It's, it's a matter of months. 
the commission has proposed a timeline that sees the first three years of application of the CBAM uh, not imposing any charges. It would just be a practice run where data was collected, but no charges imposed. Starting in 2026, charges would be imposed, ramping up over a 10-year period uh, as free allowances ramp down over the same period so that the full CBAM charge would take effect uh, at the end of 2035 by 2036. The impacts on any given country are going to depend first on the total value of goods exported to the EU under the covered sectors. Uh, and also, of course, on the significance of that value to the national economy, whether measured in terms of share of GDP or share of total exports. And second, uh, depending on the GHG intensity of the production for those goods. If the GHG intensity of production is lower in the country of export than it is in the EU, then that country will have a competitive advantage against EU producers in the EU domestic market. If it is higher, then that country will suffer a, a competitive penalty relative to EU producers. And finally, of course, it will depend on any carbon price paid in the country of export because there will be an adjustment down of the uh, CBAM charge. To give some idea of what those kinds of vulnerabilities look like, these two tables lay out the extent of covered goods, the value of covered goods in the uh, sectors covered by CBAM. To be clear, these are not figures of total impact. These are total trade. That total trade may be reduced by some percentage, but certainly not by the full percentage you see here. The table on the right lays out um, the value of trade in terms of uh, absolute value of exports. And you can see that China is the uh, second leading exporter uh, of covered goods to the European Union after the Russian Federation. Um, if we look, though, at the, call, at the table on the right, which assesses the value of those goods in terms of their percentage of GDP, because China is a large and diversified economy and has a diversified uh, stream of exports to many different countries, it does not even figure in the top 20 in terms of top uh, uh, GDP impacting uh, countries. Um, the, the, the largest, of course, is Mozambique, as we can see here on the strength of its aluminum exports. But all of which is to say that the number of covered goods, the value of covered goods from China is significant um, at an, in an absolute level, not as significant in terms of uh, its impact on the entire Chinese economy or on China's level of exports. I want to briefly address a question about the uh, uh, compatibility of the CBAM with the principle of common but differentiated responsibility. This is a principle that dates back to the 1992 Rio Convention, uh, Declaration on Environment and Development, uh, which says that those countries that have caused, that are least responsible for causing environmental damage and that have the least means by which to address it should undertake the least burdens, that those countries that are most historically responsible for climate change, for example, should be leaders in addressing it. And those countries that are least able to address climate change should be getting support from the, the countries that are most responsible. So does the CBAM violate this principle? On its face, it seems to. Yes, it is placing a burden on developing country exporters to help the EU meet its climate goals. Uh, but there are two additional considerations that are important here. One, it's, it's a little more complicated than that because the principle also calls for developed countries to show leadership on climate ambition. One could argue that the EU's carbon pricing is exactly that kind of leadership, and one could argue that it would not be possible without border measures. And another side trip here, yes, there are other ways to address climate change, the US IRA being one, but it's... <laughs> We've just seen the uh, European Union's response to the IRA, which uh, contends that it contains at least nine measures which are uh, uh, problematic under WTO law because they are distortionary of international trade, five of which have local content requirements, which again would uh, uh, divert investment away from the EU and toward uh, uh, the United States. So those other measures, while they... Well, other measures are also problematic. 
a little side group. Uh, the other consideration for uh, common but differentiated responsibility is that in the design of the final design of the CBAM, we should expect to see some recycling of the revenues generated by CBAM back to developing country exporters to help with cost of compliance, to help with decarbonization. This would be the fair thing to do and would be compatible with common but differentiated, resp or, uh, common but differentiated responsibility. We hope to see that. Very briefly, and I won't go into detail on this, but I want to end where Mr. Wu ended by saying that the CBAM is, um, is a, an indicator of a broader trend, a trend to consider more carefully carbon in exported uh, and traded goods, and a trend toward considering carbon uh, competitiveness as an aspect of international global competitiveness. There is a, the CBAM itself uh, is being considered within the EU, but also being considered in Canada, in the United Kingdom, and in some form in the United States. Those will not be the last countries to consider it. But we have other sorts of measures which also consider the carbon in traded goods. Clean fuel standards, such as the uh, um, fuel directive in the EU, the clean fuel standards in Canada and in some US states that are based on the carbon content of fuel. Anti-deforestation laws, which are also part of the EU Green Deal, which will consider the carbon a footprint of imported products, agricultural and forest products. This is a very significant one. GHG intensity performance standards affecting imports and a host of private sector measures. This is all part of a, a, a broad universe, a trend toward a, a greater concentration on carbon in traded goods. Um, and uh, as Mr. Wu said, toward considering carbon competitiveness as an aspect of global competitiveness in the markets of the future. Uh, just to put the CBAM in context. Thanks very much, and, and I, I hope this has been helpful. Thank you, Aaron, for, I believe, a very um, illustrating uh, presentation on some of the, the details of the CBAM. Uh, what I believe stuck out for me is that uh, you were developing how the CBAM is picking up primarily on the specific emissions from the production process of a product imported to Europe. And in your view, clearly uh, making this not an instrument of coercion, but of uh, developing a level playing field with uh, European producers. Um, I also believe it's important that you were highlighting some of the practical challenges of Chinese exporters to engage with the CBAM. And this, I think, requires really further discussion because of the different scoping of the Chinese uh, carbon pricing system and the um, yeah, focusing on emissions intensity, not um, <clears throat> on the explicit carbon price, focusing uh, on a different scope of who is covered by the scheme. So um, this is creating some very practical uh, challenges in the implementation from uh, a Chinese export perspective. I think what is also important um, for me is that you were also highlighting that at least in the startup phase of the EU CBAM, its practical relevance for Chinese exports will indeed be rather limited. Um, looking at overall GDP, this I believe is an important point to have, let's say, uh, uh, yeah, a good debate on how to make it work as good as possible. And um, as Mr. Um, Wu was also saying, um, you were underlining that the CBAM actually is not um, is, uh, something that is it's an alien to the new world of uh, carbon uh, neutrality policies, but really part of a broader picture emerging on how to bring uh, carbon constraints, not only into domestic policies, but also increasingly in the international trading system. So thank you, Aaron, for this. Um, I'm conscious of the time. We had uh, said we would uh, have a coffee break until about two minutes from now, which makes it a very, very short coffee break. Now, in the interest of uh, all colleagues um, physically in the meeting, I suggest that we restart after the tea break um, at um, 5.25 uh, 
China time and uh, 1025 um, Berlin time. So thank you for the keynotes and um, there's a seven minute uh, tea break now. So thank you for keeping this tea break very short. I think all the participants in the panel discussion now will um, appreciate the, the time that they have to have a very good and um, rich discussion. Um, we have heard several perspectives on uh, carbon trading in China, in, the, in Europe. We've uh, heard perspectives on why uh, Europe is establishing a carbon border adjustment mechanism and some of the very, very practical um, uh, challenges that will result from its implementation. Now, I will hand over to my colleague Isadora Wan, who is a senior advisor, China industry at uh, Agora Energy Transition China, um, to lead into, to introduce the panel debate and to moderate this debate. Isado, the floor is yours. You're muted still. I cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Super, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so today we've already heard from a lot of experts about the carbon trading market as the earliest and also the most mature market there is, the China's. Okay, let's see if the echo is gone. Okay, now it works. So the carbon market in China will cover um, the most um, carbon tradings. So that's why our discussion today is around the topic of the prospects of Europe-China cooperation on carbon markets. We have invited five important uh, guests from both China and abroad. I'm going to give them each round of opportunity to um, share their views. I'm going to introduce themselves before they go first, and I'm going to share with them the questions. So in this roundtable, we would like to have real and in-depth discussion. So we encourage uh, panelists to um, have interactions outside of the questions. If you would like to comment um, as a member of the audience, you can also raise your hands. I'm going to invite you to speak. Okay, um, I would like to also remind each guest to speak within four minutes. I may raise my hand and interrupt you if you go beyond. Now, first of all, we have vice, uh, we have, um, please turn on your um, camera while I call, call upon you. So first of all, we have uh, Tian Wei who has ten, more than 10 years of experience in the carbon trading market, who's also involved in the design of China's national carbon market. My first question to Mr. Tian um, from China Beijing Grain Exchange is that both this morning, um, we have heard already from several Chinese experts who have talked about the development outlook for the Chinese carbon market. So my question to you is that what are some of the um, challenges or pain points that we urgently need to resolve in China's um, carbon market? What lessons do we need to learn from the European counterpart? Thank you very much. It's my great honor to have this opportunity to share my views with everyone. It is true that we've had a very productive session this morning regarding China's uh, national carbon market. I think if we look at the European um, carbon market, yes, indeed, there is a lot for us to learn from. And in terms of the design of the mechanism, instead of uh, in terms of the rules for the carbon market, um, and as well as their very mature um, carbon allocation mechanism. So it's fair to say that we are just at an initial stage here in the Chinese uh, carbon uh, market. I think there are a few things that um, are worth mentioning. So I think, first of all, we see that a governance. Uh, please give me a minute. I noticed that there are some background noises coming from your side. Yes, exactly. Please give me a moment. 
Okay, so so first of all, I think、um, in terms of governance,、um, the division of responsibilities is very good because I think ETS gives the member states a lot of、um, aut autonomy.、Um, And also, the European Union, the European Commission has、um, reviewed and also approved the、um, emission targets for different states, and it's up to the member states to decide on their own how they would like to achieve this based on their own situations.、Um, and also, it's up to the member states to decide、um, how these objectives can be implemented within their borders. So this has taken into consideration the differences in between member states while、um, respecting the total objective. I think this can stimulate. The development and implementation of ETS as a whole. In addition, we have this flexibility and compliance that is something China should learn from.、Um, if you look at the European ETS, in the Uh, the second、um, stage, you can use、um, CR to offset, and they have introduced a target for CO two emission reduction, so that. We can have this effective connection in between the carbon markets. So this has basically stimulated the development of other carbon markets while providing a lot of funds as well as technology to the other carbon markets. And this has also, to some extent, stimulated the development of the carbon markets here, not just in China but also in other developing economies. At the same time, this has made euro. A major settlement currency for the international carbon markets, and to some extent, this also helps the EU have um um this dominance in terms of the carbon pricing, and also this is highly financial in terms of the mechanism. So, if you look at um the、uh, UETS at the level of activity there, it is the most um active and vibrant market there is, and also. This has stimulated、um, the development of a lot of financial instruments related to this. I think these are the three characteristics that the Chinese national carbon market should learn from. Right now, if you look at、um, the Chinese carbon market,、um, of course, to improve that takes a process. So, on one hand, right now,、um, as we do、um, allocation. We have also included、um, power companies. Right now, for now, it's just a power sector in this process. But we're going to extend it to more sectors. In the initial stage, we have free allocation, but we plan to transition、um, to、um, auctioning for、um, the allocation mechanism. In addition, we have、um, planned to drive the development of the carbon market step by step. And also, it's very important to、um, extend the cycle so that the policy itself is sustainable.、Um, so basically, if you look at the Chinese market, we have、um, learned a lot from the European experience in terms of、um, industry. We are going to go from few industries to cover more industries, and also we're going to pursue the diversification of the products involved. So we're going to approach this step by step in a progressive manner.、Uh, in addition, if you look at the carbon pricing, this is a very important indicator.、Um, if the carbon price is too low, this actually lowers、um, the costs.、Um, this means that、um, companies are less motivated, and also the effect of constraint on large or heavy emitters is、uh, limited. So we're going to step by step reduce the amount of free allocation, and also when there is an oversupply of allocations or allowances, we're going to limit the issuing of the allowances. And I think this is very important for the Chinese market. And recently. We have、um, just come up with the plan for、uh, carbon、uh, emission allowances for 2021 to 2022, and we are going to do that、um, with the overall balance in mind. But on a, we're going to issue on a tighter side. It is、uh, really inspired by the EU ETS, including how the cap、um, is lowered gradually. I think in the future we will.、Uh, Keep looking at Europe to see how to、um, have a cap over the total control. Next, and I want to see a few words about、uh, the carbon market itself. 
see the uh, share of investors on which is often on over two thirds and when on uh, it is over uh, two thirds uh, it is more uh, viable and we're talking about institutional investors here so uh, but china's on uh, carbon market is still dominated by uh, businesses instead of investors so we look forward to more investment on uh, and investors are more sensitive to prices hence on uh, with a uh, higher percentage of investors as stakeholders uh, the market itself will be more active and sensitive with that uh, and we will have a market that is more effective and hence uh, the price will be actually more dynamic and uh, reflective of the reality thank you very much uh, mr uh, tian for sharing with us about finance inclusion of uh, stakeholders uh, and expansion of scope uh, meaning factors and uh, things that we can learn from uh, the european carbon market of course mr uh, tian mostly looked at uh, the chinese uh, market but i want to know uh, whether anyone wants to share a european practice a uh, perspective Tin Yan, are you here Ms. Dr. Xin Yan. And uh, Dr. Uh, Xin Yan is a lead analyst from Refinitiv Yan, as she is. She has uh, over 10 years of experience with powering carbon market analysis and quantitative modeling, covering both uh, Europe and China. So I would really like to pick her brain, uh, Dr. Xin, on what China can learn in that regard. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. I've uh, been working on as an analyst for over a decade well, after the Chinese uh, domestic market was established. Um, and I uh, have received a lot of questions from my European colleagues about uh, the trajectories of the Chinese market, even though the trade volume is not very high, but coverage wise, it is the largest in the world and it will only get larger and more severe significant as some um, mr tian pointed out carbon market uh, needs time uh, to go through a trial and error on uh, and well you the eu's market started uh, in 2005 at lowest point was three years and after the reform finally the carbon price started to rise by year of course uh, when i tell my european colleagues i often say we should not uh, compare the chinese market in 2022 with on uh, the 2020 of the European market. Instead, we should compare, um, you know, the Chinese uh, carbon market today with on uh, the uh, baby years of the European carbon market back then to see how um, a European I, the UETS gradually approached maturity over the years. I think Mr. Tian said it very well when he pointed out that uh, uh, for the European on uh, ETS, we need to uh, bear in mind how important uh, uh, to not steer away from our uh, goal, um, and we need to have a stable policy signals plus a functioning market and also gradually lowering cap and the ETS then must be adhered to as a very solid tool uh, to achieve the goal and this is uh, what uh, or the level of uh, stability and uh, um, predictability that is needed from the policy side the EU has gone through a lot in the past several years, including uh, the pandemic, the demand and supply and geopolitics on, in the short run. On, in in a, a couple of days, actually, the carbon price uh, plummeted to around 50 euros, but it quickly rebounded. Well, that is because the EU issued a very prudent uh, on and and, and the determined policy, uh, which indicated that the EU will not give up uh, the ETS as uh, the guidance tool uh, for carbon uh, 
reduction. And also the system itself is enhancing in terms of data collection on allowances and auctioning. And I also mentioned in 2017, we started to talk about reform as to the, uh, the stability uh, reserve mechanism, uh, which started uh, its operation in 2019 that helped uh, the market to stabilize so that the ETS can uh, play its due course. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Qin Yan, uh, Dr. Qin and Mr. Tian both uh, shared their perspective uh, from the operations of ETS and what uh, the two parties uh, can actually learn from each other and where ETS is going. And we're very glad to have the representatives of uh, the private sector on who is uh, the vice president of UCCC on and, and uh, on uh, and he, well, he uh, came to China in 2005, uh, who mainly on, uh, uh, so that is uh, Mr. On uh, uh, Carlo uh, De Andrea. He's the acting national vice president of the European uh, Chamber of Commerce and founder managing partner of DNA Partners Legal Council. Please, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, I will speak in Chinese a bit. And I'm really glad to be here to see you all. Up here with my Chinese in order to, to, to make escape all of our guests in the room and uh, outside the uh, online following. I'm really happy of uh, this invitation in uh, to participate to this uh, workshop on uh, carbon markets. My name, as uh, Isadora just said, is Carlo Andrea, and it's a great pleasure of being here. I'm the Vice President of European Chamber of Commerce in China, which is the biggest European Union Association in the country. We have over 1,800 members. And um, as you know, uh, China, together as Europe, has a set ambitious target of achieving carbon neutrality, 2050 Europe by 2060 uh, China. And now also Modi of India, they say by 2070, India will do this as well. So, and this, is very welcome by European businesses all around the world and especially in China. Saying this, I would like always to, to mention that uh, we did not inherit this world from our ancestor. We just borrowed from our kids and from our grandkids. So this is important when we are discussing about uh, this uh, matter. And thank you, Kevin and Agora, to organize this uh, workshop because it's important to come back to the human touch, to discuss, to have interaction, and to discuss which one of the common practice which can be used among countries to reach our common target. In May this year, the European Chamber published a report on uh, decarbonization, which outlined the specific barrier and opportunities that European businesses see for China and how to support China to accelerate its journey to carbon neutrality by 2060. The Chamber actually also launched its carbon neutrality action initiative through which we believe our member can work with China, Chinese company, Chinese government and local authority in sharing their expertise and technology to help China to achieve the 2060 carbon neutrality goal. Now, speaking about ATS, in Europe, third party auditors verify emission, as we have already heard from the speaker today. In China, emission are predominantly verified by desk review conducted by a carbon verification working group established by the Ministry of Ecology and Environment with third party verification only required for those with the questionable data. This might be a potential bias leading to a conflict of interest because high percentage of the companies are mainly state-owned enterprises. The introduction 
I start now with our suggestion. The introduction of a standardized reporting framework and metrics, as well as a mandatory third party verification introduced during the EU ATS third stage, helped to remove systemic flaw that had allowed illegal allowance, transaction, and tax fraud to take place. So, our main suggestion on this is uh, to try to verify if uh, the European model for monitoring, reporting, and verification can be also applied to the Chinese market. And second is like to increase uh, the market access for MRV service provider, not on the basis of their nationalities, as sadly is uh, now. Instead, uh, by following up the world track record, the worldwide track record of the companies rather than their nationality. Because our member, they have to face barrier in this sector. And we hope through discussion and negotiation, we can surpass these steps. Thank you very much. 好，谢谢戴开乐先生。这个，呃，之间的这个市场之间的这个壁垒确实。Thank you very much. Indeed, the barriers in between markets is a major issue. So next, I would like to、uh, give the floor to Mr. Christine, Project Director of ZRGIZ, to talk about、uh, the EU's、um, assessment of the development of、uh, carbon markets and also EU perspective on participating in the Chinese、um, carbon、uh, trading. So, Mr. Christian Wilkening is the project director of GIZ,、um, and also he is widely involved in a series of projects dedicated to improve the use of、um, ETS and tools here in China. The floor is yours. Thank you very much.、Um, yeah, my name is Christian Wilkening. I work for GIZ China, and、um, GIZ China has been supporting the development of emissions trading systems in China for. For a long time,、um, for ten years now, and our perspective is less on the companies, especially not European companies, being involved in the carbon market in Europe. But we work together、uh, with the Chinese government、um, to establish first the pilots, but now、um, to work on the refinement of the national system.、Um, I think it is very clear that、um, China. Learned a lot from the experience in Europe, and、uh, I think also for the further refinement, the many points were raised:、uh, diversification of trading pro-、um, products,、uh, also the further improvement of、uh, emissions data, the ex- scope extension,、um, also the alignment of other policies. There are still a lot of things that can be learned from the Europe experience because it was also、uh, it's very clear that Chinese the Chinese carbon market at this stage is n- not comparable to the European、uh, market. Um, in its already 18th year of operation, so we hope that、um, we can further、um, provide a platform to、uh, have this exchange、um, with German experts. Especially, we work together with the German Emissions Trading Authority. We have our Chinese partners here. That is on behalf of the MEE and、uh, also NCSC. I think and,、uh, Dr. Chai Chimin is also one of the panelists who will speak later on. We、we'll、continue this exchange、uh, that can help the refinement of the Chinese ETS, but、um, also going beyond this.、Um, and this is more connected to the topics before the tea break. Is that?、Um, Europe and China are both, in a way, front runners in when it comes to carbon pricing. And、uh, once the Chinese system is more developed,、um, it, together also with Europe, can build a very strong case、um, to to influence other countries in their decision to establish carbon pricing policies. So this dialogue、um, then also with third countries can be, I think, very important、uh, to find cooperative approaches. To tackle the challenge of climate change on a global level.、Um, yes. So, with this, I would first give back to you, Ms. Wang Li. 好，谢谢克里斯汀先生。
其实呃，他刚才说。Thank you very much, Christine. I think、uh, Christine has made a very good point. That is、um, the exchanges between China, Germany, and even more countries, and also exchanges at governmental level as well as in between experts is very meaningful and important、um, to improving the ETS、uh, and carbon market here in China. We also have、uh, another very important panelist, Dr. Chai Qiming, who is the director of strategic planning department of the National Center for Climate Change Strategy and International Operation. And he has participated in many important. Uh, many important、um, policy documents. He's the author and co-developer of those important、uh, policy instruments. Our question to you, Mr. Chai, is that as we build the ETS system to cover more industries, it's mentioned by Mr. Qin that we cannot use the current carbon pricing right now with the、uh, 2022 European carbon pricing. But we need to compare the current、um, carbon pricing here in China with the carbon pricing in Europe when they first built the ETS system. But the reality is that whether Whether it is in China or South Korea or Japan, their carbon price is far below that in the EU. Now, given this reality, from your perspective, what do you think about the connection as well as the mutual recognition in between the Chinese and European market? That's a very good question that you have here, which is related to the、uh, vast differences in between carbon prices in different markets. It is true that if you look at the Chinese carbon price on the carbon market right now, we are still in this、um, slow. Growth stage that is before we have reached a peaking, and compared with when the EU started its total carbon market, we already have vast differences because the EU,、um, with the de developed、um, industrial countries, there they're already entering into a stage where carbon emission is began to decline. Also, partly guided by the objective set, while China is still、um, seeing the carbon emission climbing and growing, and that's why there's vast differences in the demand and supply situation that we see in our respective carbon markets. And also, if you look at the costs for decarbonization, especially the marginal cost for of de decarbonization, is vastly different between China and Europe. So, for example, in Europe,、uh, starting from 2004 and 2005, they started to do this work, especially in industries. Of course, it's partly because in the global economy, the vision of labor is、um, industries are shifting, and also a lot of the、um, decarbonization efforts have already been adopted, and that's why they have.、Um, The, that's why their marginal costs for further decarbonization are very different from that in China. And also, given the high carbon pricing,、um, of course, in the past five years, that's why we see the carbon price rising rapidly in Europe in the past five years, especially in 2020 to 2021, with the global efforts to push for carbon neutrality. The European market,、uh, with its、uh, spot market, and also advanced.、Uh, Futures market. If you look at their expectation of pricing, they have an expectation for further increase in the price, and that's why the price, even fluctuating, is at a high level. Now, under the six article, um, six point two and six point four under the Paris Agreement, uh. On the future cooperation in between markets, especially under、um, 6.2 clause, there is an ITMO mechanism mentioned. Or in China, we refer to this as the cooperative mechanism. So, what it mostly addresses is in between markets and also in between regions, in between existing carbon markets. How do we collaborate or connect with each other? And also,、um, what are some of the technical solutions here? Now. If you look at the overall situation of the Paris Agreement in different countries until now, if you look at the objective set, the efforts put in, it is not enough to achieve this goal of two、um, degrees Celsius or one point five degrees Celsius, because Paris Agreement has sort of like a five-year plan mechanism. So、um, the um, efforts required of individual countries are stepped up、um, at. An interval of every five years. So I think that's why we may see convergence in between different、um, markets in terms of the climate actions as well as climate policies. Now, 
the collaboration in between China and European Union in the carbon market has not recently started. Actually, within a quite long period of time, even under a Kyoto Protocol, we were already collaborating, even though the collaboration was mostly project based. For example, CDM related projects are used as an, um, a platform or medium for our collaboration. So even though this was um, unilateral, um, but it really played a very important role to drive decarbonization for um, on the international level. So what we need to do is that we need to take the long term perspective. We need to see that um, in the future, there may be a lot of possibilities um, for this potential of collaboration in between China and Europe. At the same time, we need to be patient because we know that um, the, for example, in European Union, um, the to be connected within European Union requires a lot of time um, for um, things to be worked out. Um, I think dialogues like um, the one we're having today is very important, um, especially given that we're at a new historical crossroad um, at a point where major economies have proposed visions, long-term visions for carbon neutrality. In the past, when we looked at um, the European Union's goal for um, carbon peaking, it was in 1970s when uh, the peaking was already achieved. But here in China, we have set the initial goal of um, before 2030. So that means we have a gap of 50 years in between China and Europe. But if, if you look at our timeline for carbon neutrality, it's very close. So for European Union, it's 2050, well, in China, it's 2060. So the gap now has been narrowed to about 10 years in terms of the timeline we have set for carbon neutrality. And that means in the next stage, as we drive decarbonization at certain point in time into the future, our policies will begin to um, be connected, will begin to converge with each other. So um, that's why starting from now, it's very important for us to make plans for the future, to see at which uh, point in time um, our markets will be more connected. Um, we can have more collaboration with each other, not just uh, at the market level, but also at the technology level. So we can have full support to that future. I'm very optimistic here. Over to you, the moderator. Thank you very much, Mr. Chai. I think from your response, I have indeed heard hopes. And also there are two other keywords. One is that you have talked about a uh, long term. You have also talked about um, us working together to work things out. So now I would like to then invite Mr. Tin to join us again. Just now we've had a lot of discussion about collaboration in between carbon markets um, and it's not just um, about the carbon markets to achieve um, CO2 emission reduction, but there's other important mechanisms as well. So on October the 27th, the Ministry of Ecology and Environment has proposed um, the establishment of a national market for voluntary um, CO2 emission reduction. Can you talk about this the implication for the current ATS market and how do we um, work out the relationship in between these two. Thank you. I think this is a very good question that you have here because um, right now we see the uh, restarting of the um, CCER market um, and the Beijing Green Exchange is tasked with the development of the transaction system um, and platform of CCER. And we are responsible for doing the preparation and also system development work. Uh, we are also involved in setting up the um, framework as well as the rules related to this platform. So now we're working very closely with the uh, relevant authorities um, in their plan. So we hope that we can kickstart um, the CCR market as soon as possible. Um, of course, with the restarting of CCR, our hope is that it not, it's not just a complementary mechanism um, to what we already have. We hope that we can also um, engage in this collaboration with other um, carbon markets, for example, code CCR, to, uh, we can have recognition of the CCR standard so we can have effective collaboration and linkage 
and also we can introduce、um, financial resources and other capital. Um, to benefit the large number of、um, those stakeholders、um, on CCR, as well as the other stakeholders in the transactions on CCR, to together develop and contribute to the development of this market. And if you look at the State Council, and in 2016 we have seven ministries、um, or government departments that have published、um, some. Guiding opinions on building a green financial system, it is mentioned that、um, we need to develop、um, carbon-related financial products and instruments. So I think CCR、um, will uh, extend to、uh, financial products and services, including green financing, as a very important direction. So in the future, we foresee that market resources、um, and those will.、Um, Gain more influential,、uh, will gain more international influence, so that this will become China's own center for carbon pricing to empower the achievement of China's carbon、uh, neutrality and peaking goals. At the same time, we see that、um, right now, including the CCR project,、um, is not just、um, benefiting, for example, new energy.、Um, And also forestry carbon sink projects, among others,、um, with the development of CCR methodology,、uh, we think that we're going to see、uh, more options emerging. For example, in construction, transportation, and then we'll have um. Uh, more green projects on the domestic and ETS and become suppliers of the CCR. And then we can now on together more、uh, productive factors such as on technologies and finance. But for the、uh, capital market, is still uh, just a uh, look at mainly financial indicators instead of environmental or even what we call ESR on indicators because these are very difficult to be quantified. And when they make decisions, if We were to invest in CCR、uh, projects. It is important for environmental performance to be actually used,、um, and for on and you know, on、uh, carbon emissions reduction is definitely one of the best ways to evaluate environmental performance. And for carbon price, I think it is.、Uh, Uh, and now quantifiable, and it is、uh, compatible with how the、uh, uh, capital market operates, and when CCR、uh, becomes a tool for carbon pricing, it、uh, can definitely produce、uh, short, medium, and long-term benefits.、Uh, for instance, attracting investment and investment institutions will be dedicated to leveraging. Uh, and uh, domestic tools give it、uh, green on、uh, financing or on、uh, other environmental policies and relevant to capital on、uh, it will uh, be on、uh, directed at low carbon projects and thus bringing on、uh, uh, benefits. Uh, And, and that also helps with an investment、uh, to relevant sectors and in the future. I on a belief、uh, we will on、uh, see cluster effects of green projects and in, and then the CCR、uh, market volume will increase and not only through and that、uh, we will also have on、uh, you know future a、uh, market for futures on、uh, an option and we will also attract. Uh, related intellectual property rights and also translation of products, and、uh, you know,、uh, more financial institutions、uh, will be interested in、um, uh, this field, and then we'll have a climate financing investment and a financing market that is、uh, functioning. And I think the CCR will be the backbone that provides services. On as well as a platform which can be extended to on the overall green development of China and also the twenty thirty twenty sixty goals, and、uh, that also will help with environmental environment information disclosure. 
And back to you, moderator. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Tian. And from your entry, from your remarks, I heard one keyword: negative carbon. With uh, the CCR market, we will uh, see uh, the cluster effects of a green projects such as negative carbon projects, which will help uh, to attract uh, commercial investment in the future. Now, back to you, Mr. Chai. I would like to pick your brain uh, to see. Well, even though China does not have a, a CCR, you know, voluntary a reduction on the mechanism yet, what do you see um, it is heading in the future? Um, what do you think the market uh, will look like for the voluntary on car uh, emissions reduction, how that will um, have interplay with the European um, equivalent? On our part. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, this is definitely a heated uh, topic in China. The rest of the world is moving very fast. We know IRS and uh, International um, Society of uh, Finance already issued to the CPP the uh, core financial uh, principles and for the uh, VCM market, there are more requirements about a quality driven uh, development well, for the voluntary uh, reduction and with uh, the existing uh, system of methodologies, it is not absolute a reduction uh, it uh, is a reduction compared to a certain baseline especially when it comes to uh, what, what ipcc focuses this time which is uh, avoid avoided emissions and in this regard more and uh, more international attention is on uh, expecting on uh, an, an actual on uh, substantive uh, emissions reduction in the long long run especially on how to uh, really achieve the paris agreement uh, uh, target uh, so that we can have uh, a bottom up on uh, efforts including uh, you know uh, living uh, related sectors i will have more support uh, from bottom to the top for china the on uh, the underlying architecture uh, a voluntary reduction is similar uh, to the rest of the world i want to mention two things first now we have uh, uh, it is a very um effective complement to the compulsory allowance system. And there are several things about the compulsory system. First, with uh, the rigid requirements, uh, and, and, and we still need to face the reality that a lot of technologies are not ready yet. And uh, so many companies are, are reducing carbons with very little costs and low level technologies. And the second, we need the support of, of uh, support to green technologies. If we know there are a lot of ways, for example, tax breaks um, and subsidies. A lot of com countries had subsidies and tax breaks for a new energy, for instance, you know, electric uh, uh, vehicles, and et cetera. Most uh, economies uh, have uh, employed those tech uh, techniques, but as green technologies are in the new phase, uh, governments around the world understand that sub subsidies are not uh, sustainable. Take a new energy on as an example. It, it, we, if we only rely on financial support, there will be a huge gap. So a lot of mechanisms are actually uh, turning to the market for support. When on uh, emissions uh, reduction is entering what we call deep waters, on uh, market on uh, can actually on. Uh, help uh, uh, to um, gather more support for a uh, two uh, green and renewable energies through what we call siphonic effect and that also helped to diverse uh, the uh, players in the market so the market itself is more active once they uh, can see price um, being an effective tool that will follow suit naturally um actually in the domestic ets in china we're also now are looking at the small and scattered emissions and, and uh, what's emitted from uh, the household uh, 
of health schools, the same as uh, how um, Europe now is focusing on architecture and transportation. And so uh, now the uh, EDS in China will include more sectors on um, in the future. And I think that is a very important tendency. And for the voluntary reduction market uh, itself in terms of uh, data quality and effectiveness of the reduction and, and to um, it, the uh, contribution to um, reduction related green technologies, I think uh, these actually hold the key to the socioeconomic viability of uh, the measures. Only uh, when all are achieved can we uh, actually uh, find the path to the ultimate carbon neutrality. Back to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chai. After hearing your analysis, I see on the pathway to neutrality more optimistic with uh, the voluntary market, it can really extensively uh, simulate innovation. Uh, and, and for picking or neutrality, it is definitely very significant. Thank you very much, Mr. Chai. Well, uh, in, the, in the keynote session, we not only heard Aaron and Mr. Wu, who both talked about a CBAM, on it, which uh, and, and, uh, caused a lot of uh, debates in both China and uh, so now back to you, uh, Mr. Uh, and, uh, Mr. Uh, Deck. That could, uh, so I'd like to know what do you think it would impact the China-Europe trade and what do you think the Chinese enterprises will react to CBAM? Any recommendations? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Really interesting session. I like what uh, Mr. Professor Chai just said, that there are not technologies in the market still available here in China. But this is one of the points that also our European businesses said more than once, that uh, there are numerous technologies initiatives that could form a basis of EU and China work on the territory in order to reach the target of uh, decarbonization. Please, uh, in uh, these uh, conclusive uh, remarks, let me give you some uh, positive note, because uh, on the study that I mentioned earlier, 67% of our uh, European business present here in China said that they are already prepared or they already have in place at least a basic level of uh, preparation in order to reach uh, the target of uh, decarbonization. And 40% they've already established China-specific team in order to communicate with the headquarters to reach the common goal. But one of the most and this is uh, most important for me, is that 78% of our members are also positive that China will reach the target of carbon neutrality of 2030 and uh, 2060. Uh, because uh, this is uh, something, is really ambition procedure, this really ambition target, but this give you also the spirit that European business here are committed to this target as well. Now, when we are discussing about CBAM and about the corporate the cooperation between the EU and China, please, at this stage, more than ever, it's important that multilateralism and cooperation are urgently needed in order to move to a global climate agenda for world. In fact, I'm really happy that uh, Councillor Schultz was here in, uh, uh, in China uh, earlier this, uh, this month because the first time after almost two years that you have an, an European representative uh, representing one of the main industrial countries of Europe here in uh, China. Uh, when we are, this, perhaps the CBAM is uh, one of the most controversial EU measures and uh, we have seen uh, today in the presentation of our distinguished uh, uh, speakers, which now is already on legislative process. China can export more manufactured goods and services to the EU than any other countries. And this uh, is also is in the positive note in the last uh, uh, Q2 and Q3. Now, when we are, uh, unsurprisingly, the CBAM proposal has raised concern among Chinese stakeholders. Not only should the EU communicate CBAM policy 
more transparently and frequently with the Chinese their counterparties, but China should also proactively conduct rigorous research, encourage effective bilateral and multilateral dialogue, formulate coping strategy, and explore a cooperative rule setting process. Because our suggestion is the one we shall engage European businesses and European government in this, uh, in order to be updated on the latest progress of the decarbonization policy making and their implementation back in Europe. As well, we shall also provide support to domestic and think tank like the one who are hosting here today to facilitate their exchange with the EU and Chinese peers on rules, progress and impact on the CBAN. Uh, the last point that I would like uh, to mention is true that to the moment China ETS is still dominate by the bull transaction of SOE in the power generation sector only. While instead in Europe, we have a financial institution and also other sector involved in the process. And this will help to reach the European target. So our suggestion also is that to allow institutional investors uh, investor to participate in the national carbon market, develop carbon future, as uh, also other speaker was uh, mentioning forward an option in the national ATS to establish a complete financial trading, pricing and edging system for China carbon emission rights. And uh, with this, I would like to conclude and uh, thank you very much. 好，谢谢戴先生刚才的这个介绍。其实，呃，确实是像他提到的这样。这个 Thank you very much indeed. Um, as you mentioned, the collaboration in between think tanks as well as candid exchanges in between enterprises, um, as well as the um German Chancellor visit, um, to China can all facilitate the mutual trust in between um, two large economies, so that we can have sincere uh, dialogue related to CBAM. And uh, speaking of China and uh, Germany, we have a lot of very good partners in between China and Germany. And also we have some projects to work towards um, CO2 emission. So I would like to invite uh, Christian to um, talk about the project that um, he has led um, to some talk about his progress, especially the next steps for Sino-German cooperation on emissions trading system and carbon market mechanism. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. As I mentioned in my present uh, comment, this uh, cooperation between China and uh, Germany on emissions trading and carbon pricing is um, long standing and has been going on for more than 10 years. It is important to understand that, of course, for all this work and all this dialogue on carbon pricing, it's not necessarily a uniquely German perspective, but um, the, the climate policies um, especially with regard to carbon pricing, are European policies, um, but Germany as one of the biggest uh, economies in Europe and uh, also with a very diverse industry base, of course, is, a, is, a, is an important example uh, for China. And I think um, this is also something, a unique perspective that we can add to this um, exchange between Europe and China uh, on carbon pricing and climate policies. Um, for our project work, we are working together um, with the Ministry of Ecology and Environment and on behalf of the German Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action. And all this is uh, done in the framework of the International Climate Initiative, uh, short ICI, um, that has been funding uh, the cooperation. And um, uh, we are working a lot on the refinement of the Chinese national system, but then also on dialogue um, platforms to talk about broader carbon market topics um, that also that might then, for example, include uh, questions like CBAM and other carbon market mechanisms um, uh, under the um, UNFCCC and Paris Agreement. Um, I'm very happy to hear that uh, also the visit of uh, um, Chancellor Scholz was mentioned. Uh, in their talks, it was also very clear, they made it very clear that uh, um, climate cooperation will be a very important topic for the Sino-German, Sino-European relationships going forward. And um, we hope that with our work as GSZ China, we can contrib contribute to this um, dialogue um, also in the future, working 
towards a strengthened and um, more refined Chinese national ETS and then also towards a global carbon price. Thank you very much. 好，谢谢克里斯汀先生。我我想请您留步。Thank you very much. Please stay with us for a few minutes. And just to ask you a follow-up question. In the interest of time, though, I would like to ask you to give us one example of German energy companies um, who um, have um, transformation experience that results from European ETS development and how this would be learned by Chinese enterprises. Um. If you look at the sorry, I will not focus on any specific company. But if you look at the energy sector in Europe、um, and the decarbonization、um, trend since the start of the EJS, it's, it's very evident that that we are, you have seen more than forty percent reduction in the ETS sectors as a whole.、Uh, I think we've also seen graphs in one of the presentations earlier that show that、um, there's a clear decoupling of、uh, GDP development and. Um, the emissions, and this is especially drastic in the energy sector. However, this is not only because of the EU ETS,、um, but you you just can tell that all European energy providers, and that also includes the German big companies、um, in the energy sector, they have incorporated a carbon price into their daily operation. They trade carbon as a commodity, and this, of course, already is an important. Part of all investment decisions and all uh, uh, daily operations. 好，谢谢 Christian. Thank you very much, Christian. My next question goes to Dr. Qin Yan. I would like to hand over the floor to you because just now,、uh, when we、uh, were hearing to the recap of the morning session, we've also heard from Kevin that we cannot、um, develop and live in an environment that is separate from the rest of the world. So, what is your view on the?、Uh, Russian-Ukraine crisis, as well as the impact on the European energy market, and how will that have any implications for China? Thank you very much. Indeed, we have already、um, covered. This very complicated geopolitical landscape that we have right now. I think this is not just limited to Europe. This is actually evolving into a global energy crisis. But if we look specifically at、um, Europe, starting from Q4 last year, energy prices have been rising, and. Ever since the outbreak of our Russian-European war, the energy price has been climbing at a faster rate. Indeed, this is affecting the total market here in the European Union.、Um, this is affecting the、um, carbon market. This is affecting the climate policies、um, because people begin to have some questions related to have some doubts related to all of those. With rising energy prices, industry enterprises are calling upon a drop in. In the、um, energy costs now, even though we see electricity price rising in the EU, which is mostly due to the rising costs of natural gases,、um, actually the contribution from carbon price is less than ten percent compared with the costs of energy usage. But in this particular context,、um, the、um, Electricity generation costs have also taken into consideration the carbon pricing, which is a fact.、Um, right、um, back in August,、um, the carbon price has increased from about seventy euros to ninety euros, and indeed, this has contributed to higher electricity price. And right now, in this recent、uh, few months, because of the high energy costs, um, industries um, began. To cut their production, they have mentioned once and again it's important to ensure、um, the operation of the industries.、Uh, we should not allow the carbon price to rise to an extremely high level. So yes, there are impact, and also given the current context,、uh, we see increasing calling for、um, the control of、um, carbon pricing, and this has put a lot of stress on、um, the European Union because there is very urgent issues to resolve related to economic. Slow down. However,、um, the European Commission maintains that the carbon market is a cornerstone to their policy, and 
we need to accelerate the transformation of the energy market exactly because of the energy crisis, and we need a very effective mechanism to stimulate the energy transformation and also the um, allocation of carbon allowances. About fifty percent of the time are based on auctioning, and this actually provides capital and funding to the energy transformation. So the European Union has been very um, determined on this front and. And um, around eight, um, April or March, Poland is calling upon the energy price to be fixated around about 30 euros. But the e European Commission has been very firm in rejecting those ideas, saying that the carbon market should be um, uh, playing the role as an important instrument uh, for its climate policy. At the same time, we have got another signal from policymakers um, as in our discussions as market participants, we have also said that the current carbon price, about 70 euros, um, reflect the fact that in Europe, the decarbonization costs by industries. So if you look at the European policies, they are usually long lasting policies. So they are able to guide the market participants to have long term expectations. Now, because the carbon pricing has mostly reflected the, the carbonization costs of industries. So not just in Europe, but also around the world. Um, if you look at the decarbonization measures available, we have, for example, CCUS technologies, among others, that have already achieved good progress and results from the pilots and testing. Of course, they're not ready for um, large scale rollout. Um, but without the maturing of those expensive decarbonization technologies, uh, we cannot allow carbon price to exceed 100 euros or even 200 euros. So we need to make sure that there is an upper limit to the carbon pricing and this upper limit should fully consider the current level of development of decarbonization technologies and with regards to carbon market there is um, a pressure on the European Commission, but at the same time, we see this um, determination to use carbon price to uh, stimulate energy uh, commission. And in the discussion related to Fit for 50, we are now have seeing discussions about how to reform the, car uh, the carbon market. Um, for example, how to modify some parameters of the carbon market. There is also discussion about the fact that we need to also include aviation and ground gradually construction and transportation industry into the carbon market. So the reform of carbon market is also ongoing. I think this is the status quo. So in summary, what China can learn from this is that now this very serious energy crisis is a global crisis. This is a very important lesson on the importance of energy security. So we need to ensure energy security as we embrace energy transformation and uh, a lot of the European colleagues may have heard from um, a lot of Chinese colleagues saying that we need to be brave to disrupt if we want to build something new. But it's, it's very important for us to accelerate green transformation to uh, wean off on fossil fuel. And carbon market can play important roles here as an important policy instrument. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Qin, I think what you've said is very inspiring to me as well. I think any policy instrument um, cannot have its uh, full value um, felt uh, within the short term. You've talked about the European uh, determination to carbon market and the ongoing reform efforts, everything's 2015 until now. And even with the drastic um, price hike, they have not um, hesitated at all. So indeed, like you've said, you've talked about the importance of being brave enough to suffer some disruptions if you want to build something new. I think this is a very important lesson for both China and Europe. Now, in the interest of time, I will not uh, ask you to engage in further dialogue. I suggest that we put our hands together to thank all of the panelists um, that participate in our roundtable discussion. Thank you very much for your insights. Next, I'm going to hand it back to Matthias. Okay, you can hear me. I don't know. Um, somebody has yeah. to restart my video. Yes, we can hear you, Matthias. Okay.
you can hear me and now you yes. can see me as well oh thank you um so i will not uh give a long summary of a very very rich discussion above all uh, to me it shows that uh, there is not only uh, a real appetite for an exchange between experts and decision makers from china and europe but that there's also um some real value in particular the panel discussion now has shown uh, this real value and there was one um issue mentioned that uh, i think is important for all of us to to realize setting aside the the current uh, energy crisis which we are um facing due to the russia ukraine war and all the related uh, effects in europe but actually worldwide um <clears throat> we do have uh, an ongoing climate crisis and this climate crisis we will only um, overcome by increased cooperation and it was mentioned um, in the panel debate that at this point in time uh, about 70 percent of carbon emissions worldwide are under carbon neutrality commitments with different timelines 2050 2060 in case of india 2070. this being said what does it, it, it does mean that we are all uh, on a converging pathway uh, towards climate neutrality, depend, indifferent of uh, the starting points where we are coming from. And I think this has been, uh, this is something to really keep in mind. This is not only a short term debate we're having in Europe and in China, how to set up an instrument, but it's a long haul. It's a marathon in which we are engaging. And so continuing to debate um, on how to move forward on a converging pathway is really, really critical. Now, today we have seen that in Europe when it comes to carbon pricing, um, this is really central to Europe keeping its climate ambition and transitioning to climate neutrality. And um, the CBAM um, is at this point in time a necessary complement to increase climate ambition and to a situation where the free allocation of emission allowances given to industry is not sustainable in the long term. So there needs to be a different pool in place to level the playing field um, for differences in carbon pricing. Um, now in China, uh, the situation is different. Their carbon pricing is just starting up and um, experience is being gained, but in perspective, because of the uh, enormous um, importance of the Chinese economy, of course, this could become one of the linchpins of global climate efforts, uh, the Chinese carbon trading system. Now, we have seen, particularly in the pen debate and in the keynotes, uh, that there are some similarities which are being discussed when it comes to emissions data, how to allocate specific allowances to different uh, players in the market. But at this point, there are also differences. And these differences, I believe, uh, relate primarily, and this was also mentioned, to the different points where China and Europe are uh, in the transition to climate neutrality. In Europe, this has been a fairly long-standing policy. Uh, emissions have been uh, reduced since the 1990s, and we are now aiming for minus 55% reduction by 2030, whereas in China, peak emissions is uh, still to come. But then again, as I said, the uh, long-term targets are actually quite similar. So um, what does it mean? It does mean that we are um, well advised to continue collaborating and cooperating, not only, but in particular, because of uh, the growing um, geopolitical difficulties that exist at the moment. Um, to come back to my starting point, climate uh, policy is a marathon, and we will only win the marathon jointly and together and so cooperation is what it takes. Now, from the side of Agora Energiewende, we are collaborating with our Chinese partners to develop or to offer a space for this type of cooperative dialogues. And we will continue uh, to do this in the future. We are working on not only carbon pricing policies, but as I mentioned, on all the different aspects of uh, climate neutrality policies in the power sector, industry buildings, transport, um, and in the future also agriculture. So I'm very, very optimistic that um, we will have 
more of these very fruitful exchanges going forward. So thank you to all participants. Thank you to all the speakers and of course to Kevin and the team in um, China for putting this together. And I hand over to our co-organizers. Thank you. On behalf of uh, SIIS, I would like to uh, give my appreciation to the 20 or so speakers on uh, this morning and this afternoon, as well as all the participants and everyone that uh, has provided a great support to the conference, including the interpreters and to the staff online and offline for their contribution and in a well, lots of report leading to COP27 pointed out that our existing efforts on uh, temperature rise control and uh, carbon emissions reduction, there remains a huge gap. We must redouble our efforts. We must increase uh, the efforts, you know, give it uh, um, policies, finance, etc. that have been discussed today. Um, and we probably need to break the boundary of our imagination even and to give it, uh, you know, innovation of uh, innovation or technology or reforms. We need to revolutionize our existing pathway to achieve the 1.5 degrees uh, goal. Give it to scholars from China and Europe. We've shared different dimensions and perspectives about carbon pricing, reaction, and uh, efforts, uh, their logic and uh, legitimacy. And we've also discussed uh, the existing drawbacks and the problem of cost. Uh, regardless of all that, uh, when we look at the future, on uh, the, the comparative advantage relating to carbon is going to determine the advantage of an uh, industry, a sector, those uh, that pay a lower carbon cost uh, will uh, go a longer way. And for all the policy tools uh, that we've debated about, there are participants, but there are also uh, parties that uh, benefit from it, for example, the citizens and cities and also those that suffer damages and losses. For example, when we discuss a carbon pricing and a carbon market, we need to think about how to transmit the benefits to all entities from businesses, manufacturers to every consumer and decision maker in cities and different country government all the way to different decision making bodies and practitioners and industries so they can feel in the carbon the trade market regrettably uh, scholars from both china and europe understand that the transmission to effort and particular consumers needs to do more especially in china or well, carbon market is one of the many tools uh, that we can leverage it is not really ranked that high in developing countries in terms of its effectiveness how do we enhance cooperation with europe it's time to discuss that apart from cooperation on technologies we need to reduce carbon emissions we now Perhaps China, Europe, uh, give it uh, uh, the academics and a government need to think about uh, how to prepare ourselves for the cooperation of carbon-based uh, global governance from policies, measures, uh, the planning, and how to, uh, you know, together uh, with uh, the uh, other countries and international organizations make the two cooperations. I think China and Europe uh, are perhaps setting a paradigm for such cooperation and we can start with entities in different sectors and industries and from that point i believe our workshop have discussed a lot about i have a lot to discuss you know transportation and boating um agriculture and we also 
uh, have discussed, uh, you know, from 2035, 2050, 2060, and even longer time scale. And I solidly believe and we, uh, in the future uh, conferences, will talk about how to challenge the traditional or conventional field of vision that we have. We need to revolutionize the, our mindset to uh, achieve better cooperation between China and Europe. But once again, I would like to say a big thank you to all participants, in particular those uh, that worked very hard on preparing this workshop, the organizing committee. And I hope that next year we on uh, will have a, an offline session where everyone can talk to each other face to face. The Chinese and the European experts that can shake hands and uh, physically and uh, for more success between China and Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that concludes uh, the workshop today. Thank you.